welcome to our um, New Drugs for JM uh, mini symposium. Um, first of all, I'd like to give a, um, a shout out, um, particularly to the folks um, at Duke. Um, so um, Anne Reed, Carve Adelan, and uh, Jeff de Virgin. A special shout out to Jeff. When we started um, coming up with the idea um, for this symposium, uh, I know I got a few sideways glances. It's like you were expecting to get CME credits um, for this, and it's thanks to Jeff's diligence um, that uh, we actually did manage um, to pull that off. So uh, thanks very much for the Duke team. You'll be hearing from all of them um, during the course of the symposium, either as presenters, chairs, or Carve is going to wrap up um, the symposium. Also like to, a special shout out to um, those folks from the foundation that are online. Um, so I'm not sure if um, our founders, Tom and Shari are online yet, but um, obviously um, due acknowledgement for their tireless efforts and their inspiration for setting up the foundation, foundation all those years ago. Um, I know some of our board members are online um, so special welcome to some of those as well, or all of those board members, uh, particularly uh, Suzanne and Matali, who are co-chairs of our research committee, uh, to members of our National Leadership Council that I know some of you have been invited to um, join, and I see some of you um, online. Um, also, big acknowledgement to the staff members from the Foundation for all the work they've done um, in the background. Big shout out to members of our MAB that are here, obviously to the presenters um, that have given up their Saturday um, to present. Um, and that's clearly been the big draw card and why we've got so many attendees and why we've got so many global attendees um, to this symposium. So thank you very much um, to everybody that's presenting today ahead of your presentations. And I think the disclosure from the foundation is that the foundation remains um, passionate about um, Find, trying to find a cure for JM, as the name of the foundation um, implies. Passionate about driving forward science programs, driving forward clinical programs, driving forward clinical care, and always being driven by science and evidence-based medicine and being driven by uh, the capable members of our medical advisory board. Um, this symposium basically came about from um, a number of um, avenues and people that were feeding in. Um, so Jim and I um, had a really good week um, in DC for uh, Rare Drug Week and we had a great meeting with um, uh, Bob Colbert and Hannah Kim. They were very passionate about what uh, they were doing and they're going to talk about, well, certainly Hannah's going to talk about one of the trials that um, they were doing. So I think that was where the seed was planted for the symposium. Then when I was speaking to our chair of our MAB, Dr. Lisa Ryder, um, we bemoaned the fact that we don't have our re regular medical conference associated with our family conference because of COVID-19. And um, Lisa and I basically came up and tried to find a date that was appropriate where we could try and shoehorn in um, this symposium in between ACR and um, IMAX and CARA meetings and a few other things. So we managed to shoehorn this um, just before the, um, the ACR. Uh, what's the foundation and, you know, what are we trying to do? Um, uh, and how does this symposium fit in with what the foundation's aims and goals are? The foundation from a very top level is looking for better treatments, you know, in trying to find a cure and really improving the lives of our JM kids and their families. And we've got three pillars whereby we try and affect that lofty goal um, by accelerating scientific discovery. Um, so looking at funding programs that include genomics, environmental factors of flares, mechanisms of disease, um, et cetera. We then look at trying to expedite and develop treat new treatments. This is re really where um, this symposium fits in. It's looking at, you know, what can we do as far as repurposing drugs? What can we do with clinical trials? As we're a patient advocacy foundation, you know, we really can help bridge uh, that critical role between somebody running a clinical trial, wanting to run a clinical trial, even planning a clinical trial and enrolling patients. And we also like to provide um, 
excellence in care. That's done through um, our centres of excellence, which includes um, Lurie, um, GW, um, <coughs> uh, the new one um, at um, Seattle, and of course, um, Duke. Um, we also look at funding early career investigators and fellowships just to try and keep the pathway of the future rheumatology leaders coming through um, the, the funnel and the educational program to provide the next leaders. And one of the critical things we like to do as a foundation is foster collaboration. And that's part of the aim of this symposium is to really make the global JM community aware of what's happening from a, a drug development, drug uh, translational perspective um, and how you could potentially work and collaborate with some of those folks that are actually running uh, these clinical programs. My last slide, when the foundation actually asked all those uh, generous folks that um, fund the foundation, what did they really want? Um, the overwhelming response was new treatments with less side effects and or a cure and or personalised medicine. So really this symposium just really highlights what we're trying to do as a foundation, which is, you know, what drugs are coming through the clinic. We are um, a rare disease. We don't have any specific drugs that have um, a registered uh, indication for JM. So what we're looking at doing is repurposing drugs into JM, you know, what's coming through the pipeline. And critically, what is not in the pipeline at the moment what might be exciting from a, a JM perspective. So there's a lot of activity in the Jack Stat area. We're going to hear quite a lot um, about that um, uh, during the course um, of the morning and this afternoon. So that is where I am going to leave it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to the chair um, of our first session. So that, um, our first session is being chaired by uh, Dr. Robert Colbert, uh, received his combined MD and PhD from University of Rochester, also completed an internship and residency in paediatrics, um, continued his rheumatology training at Duke University of North Carolina, spent several years at Cincinnati Children's um, and the University of Cincinnati before joining the NIH. He's the clinical director of NIAMS Chief of the Paediatric Translational Research Branch. Um, he's got a, variety, a wide variety of interests. And the thing that we all love Robert for is because of the many exciting things that he's done. Um, he's led a compassionate use program studying JAK inhibitors in refractory JM. So with that, I'd like to hand over to um, Rob. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Andrew, can you hear me? I can. Okay, so I assume everybody else can. Um, so thanks uh, very much for that introduction. And um, I also extend my thanks to the Cured JM Foundation um, for, uh, for hosting this and uh, really for putting this together. It looks like an exciting program. Uh, and I appreciate also being asked to, uh, to moderate this session. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker who is, uh, you've already heard his name, Jeff um, DeVergston. Uh, Jeff is an associate professor of pediatrics in the Division of Rheumatology at Duke University. Um, Jeff's clinical and research interests are in um, juvenile dermatomyositis and uh, auto-inflammatory conditions. And Jeff is the co-director of the uh, Duke Cure JM Foundation uh, Center of Excellence in uh, Juvenile Idiopathic Myopathies. Um, and so his focus is really working to further develop um, research and clinical efforts uh, in, the, in the center um, at Duke. So the title of, of Jeff's talk today is Introduction to uh, Biology and Potentially Druggable Targets in, in JM. Well, thank you, Dr. Colbert, and also Dr. Heaton. I appreciate you know, the effort and commitment of those uh, individuals who are speaking today as well as the time of those of you who are attending this symposium. And as always, um, we at Duke here with our, the Center of Excellence appreciate the support of the CureJM Foundation. Um, as many of you, us are aware in most papers regarding juvenile myositis note early on in the introduction, 
The pathogenesis of juvenile myositis is complicated and not completely understood. Although there are well-described central players that contribute to these inflammatory myopathies. I will discuss juvenile my myositis as it relates to juvenile dermatomyositis, the most common of the juvenile idiopathic inflammatory myopathies. Given the presence of autoantibodies and the responsiveness of JDM to immunosuppressive therapy, it is considered an autoimmune disease. However, in many cases, response to immunosuppression is incomplete, supporting additional non-immune mechanisms in disease pathogenesis. Further muddying the waters is the significant heterogeneity of disease phenotypes, which in part may be related to the presence of certain myositis specific antibodies. Okay, Andrew, next slide. Whoops, oh, go back one, I'm sorry. I was, um, today I will give an overview of the pathogenesis of the juvenile myopathies but then concentrate on the roles of the innate and adaptive immune systems. I will discuss the mechanisms of action of the most widely used immunosuppressive medications. I will close with some thoughts about potential and promising drug targets, including the JAK fat pathway very briefly. Okay, thank you, Andrew. The next slide, or this slide is intended for illustrative purposes only and to give a general overview of pathogenic mechanisms. It's not meant to imply specific relationships or to be exhaustive in scope, but only to show the complexity of these relationships. It's considered that JDM, like many other autoimmune diseases, is triggered by an environmental factor. These include infectious agents, UV exposure and other potential inciting exposures. Next, please. Affected individuals are set up for developing autoimmune disease secondary to genetic factors, including expression of MHC genes. Class II MHCs are expressed constitutively by professional antigen presenting cells, such as macrophages, B cells, and dendritic cells. The roles these alleles play in determining risk is considered to be based on their effects in presenting and processing antigen. Next, please. This triggers an immune response. And as we see, there are a variety of immune cells that are implicated in the pathogenesis of JDM. And current therapies target these cells as well as their soluble mediators. Next, please. Clinical signs of inflammatory vasculopathy are present in JDM and are evidence of damage to muscle, skin, and other organs. Deposition of immune complexes with terminal complement proteins contribute to a non-necrotizing vasculitis of small vessels, resulting in endothelial wall thickening and prothrombotic environment leading to tissue ischemia. Players implicated in tissue injury and thrombosis include immune complexes and complement proteins leading to occlusion and infarction of capillaries, venules, and arterioles. Next, please. Endothelial cell activation is defined by the endothelial expression of cell surface adhesion molecules such as VCAM, ICAM, and endothelial leukocyte adhesion molecules, also known as E-selectin. Endothelial cell activation is typically induced by pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF-alpha and IL-6 and facilitates the recruitment and attachment of circulating leukocytes to the vessel wall. Again, this environment is proangiostatic. Next, please. Another important immunological feature of JDM is the upregulation of MHC class I molecules on the sarcolemma of myofibers as an integral part of the MHC CD8 T cell complex. In addition, continuous upregulation of MHC class I myofibers has been associated with an endoplasmic reticulum stress response with the accumulation of misfolded glycoproteins and activation of NF-kappa B. ER stress is considered a non-immune mechanism of disease pathogenesis in the idiopathic inflammatory myopathies. Next, please. 
Type 1 interferons are involved in the maintenance and regulation of immune processes, such as antigen presentation, including MHC class 1 expression, maturation of dendritic cells, activation of signaling pathways involved in induction of genes encoding pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, as well as differentiation of T cells. These effects bridge the innate and adaptive immune systems. Type 1 interferons signal through the JAK-STAT pathway. Next, please. The presence of antigen on regenerating muscle suggests that immune-mediated muscle damage may be sustained in cases where persistent antigen expression is associated with molecular or with muscle repair. Some of these are autoantigens associated with myositis-specific antibodies. Cellular and soluble constituents of the innate and adaptive immune system are in part responsible for the initiation and perpetuation of disease manifestations associated with JDM. The initial trigger for autoimmune disease involves recognition of molecules, often self or microbial nucleic acids by innate sensors. Dendritic cells are antigen presenting cells that play a crucial role in both innate and adaptive immunity and provide antigen to T cells to induce immune responses. In JDM, plasma cytoid dendritic cells have been identified as an integral player in the pathogenesis of disease being found in affected skin and muscle. PDCs are identified by CD123 and CD303. They're not abundant in quiescent tissues, but are rapidly recruited by inflammation. They resemble secretory lymphocytes and constitutively express low levels of class two MHC that can be upregulated upon activation. Next slide, please. They also express high levels of nucleic acid detecting toll-like receptors, including TLRs 7, 8, and 9. The TLRs are located in endosomes after being processed in the endoplasmic reticulum. Next, please. TLRs recognize single-stranded RNA and unmethylated CPG motif containing DNA. Next, please. PDCs respond to nucleic acid detection with expression of transcription factors, including interferon regulatory transcription factors three and seven and NF kappa B. Next. In response, the cell produces type one interferons, next please, which then bind the interferon receptor. After producing type 1 interferons, PDCs differentiate into professional antigen presenting cells. Next, please. And a marker of maturation, CD83, is rapidly transported to the surface from the Golgi. Once again, activated dendritic cells act as a bridge between the innate and adaptive immune systems. These cells express high levels of MHC class 2. two and co-stimulatory molecules, including CD40, CD80, and CD86, that enable them to present antigen to CD4 T cells. Next, please. Next, sorry. Once the single-stranded RNA is processed, it's combined with an MHC class II molecule in the endosome. Next, please. The MHC class II antigen complex is translocated to the cell surface for presentation to CD4 positive T cells. The naive CD4 T cell can bind to MHC2 by its T cell receptor and the co-stimulatory receptors. Next, please. Both the dendritic cell and now activated T cell produce pro-inflammatory cytokines to attract and influence other cells. The T cell can differentiate into one of a number of effector T cells producing signature cytokines. Next, please. Next, please. Another factor expressed by PDCs in response to type 1 interferon is a tumor necrosis factor family 
cytokine B lymphocyte activation factor, or BAF, which promotes B cell activation, differentiation, and proliferation. Once again, another link between innate and adaptive immunity. Next, please. Next. Although there are similarities between adult and juvenile myositis, and these similarities have benefited research and treatment efforts in juvenile myositis, it is important to note that these diseases are not identical. Differences include the levels of various cytokines and transcription factors that have been found in treatment naive individuals with JDM and DM. Another significant difference is the expression of autoantibodies. While individuals with adult DM have a predominance of antisynthetase and MI2 antibodies, these are less common in, old, in children who tend to develop anti-transcription intermediary factor one and anti-MDA5 as well as anti-NXP2 antibodies. These myositis specific antibodies are associated with autoantibody phenotypes and prognosis. Next, please. Initially, the abundance or relative scarcity of B cells on histologic exam was taken to suggest the degree of B cell involvement in juvenile myositis, including juvenile dermatomyositis. Advancements in molecular techniques has allowed for a more in-depth examination of the elements of B cell activities occurring in affected tissues. Chronic inflammation is driven by sustained expression that is difficult to clear either because it is a self antigen in the case of autoimmunity or one that is constantly replenished by an organism as an infection. The site of persistent antigen presentation is commonly infiltrated by effector cells of the immune system, mainly T cells and macrophages, but also B cells, plasma cells, and dendritic cells in response to soluble mediators, including lymphokines and chemokines. Once there, these cells may organize themselves anatomically and functionally as in secondary lymphoid organs, leading to the de novo formation of distinct B cell and T cell areas including follicles and pericortic cortex regions. Crucial processes that occur in secondary lymphoid organs include B and T cell priming, clonal expansion, antigen retention, somatic hypermutation, affinity maturation, immunoglobulin class switching, B cell receptor revision, and maintenance of peripheral tolerance. These processes may be recapitulated in tertiary lymphoid structures. These structures have been identified in inflamed muscle in juvenile dermatomyositis. Next, please. Switching gears now to discuss treatment. Mainstays of therapy for JDM include prednisone. Next, please. IVIG, and next, and methotrexate. The interesting aside here was when I was looking for cartoons for prednisone, they all, or many of them, concentrated on the bad effects of, um, of prednisone and, and were similar to this one where it talked about, you know, making you crazy or, you know, some of the other ill effects. Um, so next slide, please. As we are well aware when considering medications and treating autoimmune diseases, we may ask, you know, how, you know, how big the medication should be, how significant are we, you know, trying to affect the immune system. When we consider steroids, we consider them to be big hammers um, with wide ranging effects versus uh, biologic, for instance, which may be more specific for certain cytokines or a cytokine receptor. 
Another question we ask next, please, is whether we need to use more than one agent to accomplish our desired outcome. And in juvenile myositis, the answer is yes. Next, please. Glucocorticoids remain the cornerstone of therapy in JDM. Using information gathered from the JDM treatment survey and expert opinion, CARA members developed three consensus treatment plans for moderately severe JDM. These include combinations of methylprednisolone, prednisone, methotrexate, and IVIG. Next, please. Glucocorticoids have numerous effects on immune cells, including induction of apoptosis, inhibition of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and inhibition of cell migration and differentiation. Next, please. Glucocorticoids signal through genomic and non-genomic pathways. The initial step in the genomic pathway is binding of glucocorticoid to the cytosolic glucocorticoid receptor. In the absence of hormone, the glucocorticoid receptor is mainly located in the cytoplasm. It's part of a multi-protein complex that includes the chaperone proteins, HSP70, HSP90, as well as P23. After binding glucocorticoid, the receptor undergoes a conformational change, resulting in the dissociation of the multi-protein complex. This leads to a structural reorganization of the cytosolic glucocorticoid receptor protein exposing to nuclear localization um, signal. The ligand bound receptor is rapidly translocated to the nucleus through nuclear pores. Inside the nucleus, the ligand complex binds directly to glucocorticoid response elements the first effect generated by the ligand bound complex within the nucleus is transrepression, consisting of inhibition of genes which promote cytokine and other protein synthesis involved in the inflammatory response. As intranuclear concentrations of glucocorticoid increases, a second process of transactivation begins. Although this mechanism stimulates transcription of some inhibitory genes, transactivation mainly mediates the activation of gluconeogenesis, insulin resistance, skin atrophy, and inhibition of bone formation, all well-known adverse effects of glucocorticoids. The non-genomic pathway occurs through the modulation of immune cells through three mechanisms. The first by blocking the production of arachidonic acid by inhibiting the activation of phospholipase A2. Secondly, activation of membrane brown bound glucocorticoid receptor leads to the reduction of lymphocyte activity by P38 MAP kinase. And lastly, nonspecific interactions with the cellular membranes of immune cells results in the inhibition of ATP production, decreasing cell activity. Next, please. Methotrexate was originally designed and developed approximately 80 years ago as a folate antagonist to be utilized at high doses in several types of malignancies. Although its mechanism of action in autoimmune disease has not been fully elucidated, methotrexate is the most common first-line agent used alone or in combination with other agents. It has been proposed that the main effect of methotrexate in immunomodulation is through its effect on intracellular and extracellular adenosine levels. Methotrexate has been shown to increase the level of 5 amino imidazole 4 carboxamide ribonucleotide, or otherwise known as ACAR, which is a potent inhibitor of adenosine deaminase, leading to increased concentrations of adenosine. Adenosine has multiple effects on cells of both the innate and the adaptive immune system. Next, please. These effects include decreased dendritic cell production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, decreased adhesion of neutrophils to endothelial cells, and decreased activation of B and T lymphocytes. Next, please. Interferon also plays a role in the production of the adenosine receptor. Interferon produced following a trigger of the innate immune system can lead to production 
and expression of the A1AR adenosine receptor, which is then available for binding of adenosine. Next, please. Next, please. Next. Thank you. Adenosine also influences dendritic cell maturation through the binding of the A1AR receptor. Next, please. Next. Maturation is occurring through CD83. Next, please. Intravenous immunoglobulin, or IVIG, has demonstrated efficacy in JDM with wide ranging effects, including but not limited to modulation of cell migration, generation of anti idiotype antibodies, thereby reducing pathogenic autoantibodies effects on activation, differentiation, and effector functions of B and T cells, as well as dendritic cells. Also inhibits the complement system by preventing the formation of the membrane attack complex, thus preventing subsequent tissue damage. IVIG has been used in refractory skin and muscle disease and is steroid sparing. The efficacy and safety has been reported in open label studies, both retrospective and prospective. Next, please. In discussing the pathogenesis of juvenile myositis, we have touched on current and potential drug targets. These potential targets include the complement system, soluble mediators of immune activation and inflammation, and therapy aimed at the cells that produce these mediators including dendritic cells and B and T lymphocytes. There have been promising results targeting the terminal component C5 of complement with a human monoclonal antibody, eculizumab. This biologic is used in treating atypical HUS. There are many other anti-complement component therapies currently under development. Challenges in the development of complement inhibitors include the high levels of circulating complement proteins, which are much higher than cytokines, as well as a relatively rapid turnover of these proteins. Other targets include C-C and C-XC motifs um, of the chemokines, including CXCL10. There's also been success with anti-B cell therapy, as noted in lupus, by targeting B cell activating factor and anti-April. There are more anti-B cell therapies that are in development. Rituximab has demonstrated efficacy in juvenile myositis, primarily um, in various case studies, as well as post hoc analysis of the RIM trial. From a complement, next please. From a complement standpoint, anti CD3 is under development to modulate PDC maturation. Next please. Of course, given the concentration of today's symposium on JAK-STAT and interferon, this is a current um, pathway that is of great interest. A number of pro-inflammatory molecules activate and signal using the JAK-STAT pathway. Binding of cytokine to its cognate receptor leads to activation and phosphorylation of JAK and phosphorylation of the receptor. This in turn leads to phosphorylation and dimer dimerization of STAT. Activated stat dimer migrates to the nucleus and binds to specific DNA binding sites, regulating gene transcription. This culminates in alteration of cellular function. Inhibitors of the JAK stat pathway are effective therapies in treating many autoimmune diseases, and the benefit of these drugs in juvenile myositis is currently being considered and will be a topic in other presentations today. Next, please. 
Again, I would like to thank um, everyone who is participating in today's symposium, as well as my colleagues in the Duke Center of Excellence and CureJM. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jeff. That was a really nice uh, comprehensive overview. Um, I think in the interest of time, since we're running a little late, um, maybe we'll, uh, I'll go to one question that's been posted in the chat box. Um, and the question is, among potential drug targets, um, is there the concept of what might be better sort of for upstream treatment versus downstream treatment targets? Um, and, and whether and whether you would, uh, how you would think about maybe uh, ranking these um, in terms of your overview? Yeah, I think, you know, considering upstream targets, um, you know, again, I would view those as having a, a more wide ranging effect on the immune response versus downstream targets. Um, and I, you know, believe that there still is, uh, you know, significant benefit to looking at targeting both um, sites when we're looking at um, possible uh, therapy. Great, thank you. Uh, so again, I think, uh, again, thanks for that, um, for that really great overview and um, I think we can uh, move on to our next speaker. Um, let me introduce John. So it's, it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce John O'Shea. Um, John deserves a lengthy introduction, um, but he asked me to be brief and so I will try to be brief. Um, John's the scientific director of the National Institute of Arthritis, uh, Musculoskeletal, and Skin Diseases in the Intramural Research Program. Um, I can read it right behind Bethesda. me. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, just. <laughs> I thought maybe we'd see the guitars today, but anyway. No, no. So John, uh, uh, John went to medical school in Cincinnati, University of Cincinnati, trained in, in internal medicine um, at the State University of New York um, Upstate Medical Center and then uh, came to the NIH after that, um, did fellowship training in NIAID, and also uh, additional postdoctoral work in NICHD, Child Health and Human Development. And then he started his own lab, um, and he was initially located uh, in, the, in the National Cancer Institute, uh, but joined NIAMS in uh, 1994. So John's, you know, really main area of um, interest and in research and many contributions is, is in general in cytokines and signal transduction. Um, way too many accomplishments for me to go over in detail today, but I think of particular interest for today's talk is that his lab first cloned uh, JAK3 and demonstrated uh, its important role in a form of severe combined um, immunodeficiency which led him to initially uh, come up with the bright idea that uh, if we could target these uh, tyrosine kinases like JAK3, uh, it might actually be a pretty good way to suppress the immune system. Um, so he, I'm going to let him tell you um, that story in a little bit more detail. So the title of this talk is Introduction to the JAKSTAT Pathway, a Key Druggable Target for the Treatment of um, JDM. John. Uh, thanks so much. So, uh, my job is to introduce um, the JAKSTAT pathway and a bit about cytokines and, and then JAK inhibitors, um, and then uh, pose some questions at the end. And I'll try to do this uh, as, as succinctly as I can. Um, in terms of disclosures, um, the NIH and, and myself uh, have a patent related to um, um, targeting JAKs, um, and I've had a collaboration with Pfizer for about the last quarter century or so. And in terms of um, um, references for you to take a look at and, and, and read if you, if you really want to learn more about this pathway, I've lift, listed them here. Um, but actually, uh, we just um, published a, um, a, a cell snapshot, which uh, probably in the shortest number of words can educate you on this pathway. So if you, if you want to learn about the pathway quickly, this, this is probably the best reference for you to look through. 
So just um, Jeff did a nice job of, of uh, um, touching on these points, but um, we know that there are a lot of cytokines, probably more than 200 thing or so things that you can call cytokines, and they're critical for host defense, immunoregulation, and autoimmunity, but they're also important for hematopoiesis, growth and repair of tissue, uh, homeostasis, and metabolism. Um, and so on one level, for those of you who, who don't work on this every day, you may think it's sort of uh, a detail to, to try to organize and conceptualize all these different cytokines. But as I'll get to, um, it turns out to be important to understand a little bit about cytokine biology as you think about the drugs. So this is how um, I classify cytokines. It's, it's used by other, uh, uh, other authors as well, but there are basically seven classes of, of um, cytokine receptors. And the reason I choose to organize cytokines this way, um, spoiler alert, is that I'm gonna be talking about how these different um, cytokines um, exert their effect intracellularly. Now we know that um, uh, thanks to um, the efforts of many people over a number of years that we have an astonishing number of, of highly effective drugs, the biologics that target um, many of, of the cytokines that, that contribute to, uh, to a variety of autoimmune disease. Um, but despite the success of biologics, um, in, in many cases in, in rheumatology, um, not all patients respond completely or, or um, some patients don't respond. And so um, um, despite the, the um, astonishing success of these drugs, um, we need for other options. Um, and in thinking about how you might tackle that problem, um, we thought it was important, number one, to understand how cytokines signal, and then can um, um, signaling be um, targeted therapeutically. And I'm gonna focus on this class of receptors that are referred to as the type one, type two cytokine receptors, and that distinguishes them, this from um, other um, cytokine receptors that are pertinent to disease pathogenesis. And that's because these cytokines um, signal via the JAK-STAT pathway, as mentioned just by, by Jeff. And the JAKs um, were discovered, um, and the way we discovered one of the JAKs was by screening for libraries. It was at a time when um, people became very aware of the importance of um, kinases in, in, in signal transduction as, as proximal um, mediators of signaling as the, as the case for JAKs. Um, but the real key experiment came from Sandra Pellegrini's lab where um, with George Stark, they had generated um, mutated um, cell lines um, that were insensitive to interference because of the mutations and they reconstituted the lines and restored signaling. And, and the big surprise was that what reconstituted signaling was a, a, a sort of a, a kinase that it didn't have a very um, sort of illustrative name TIC2, tyrosine kinase 2, and that um, um, allowed uh, signaling to be restored. And so really um, was a revolutionary sort of finding um, published by Sandra Pellegrini in, in the 90s. Um, but what the, these series of lines were very helpful in, in pointing out um, the role of Jackson stats in, in signaling. But what we didn't know really at the time was the in vivo criticality of, of Jacks. And, and you would think in a way that the obvious next thing to do would be to make knockout mice, which of course have been made and, and were made. Um, but what happened at first um, was what's shown on this next slide here. So uh, as Bob mentioned, we, we cloned JAK3 um, and um, we, we cloned it from NK cells and T cells. And um, we were suspicious that it was involved based on, on Sandra Pellegrini's work that would be likely involved in, in cytokines that are important for lymphocytes. And so with uh, a old friend of mine, Warren Leonard, we investigated to see whether um, um, JAK3 was associated with um, cytokine receptors that use the common gamma chain depicted here. Um, and that turned out to be the case. We showed physical association of JAK3 with the common gamma chain. And it was right around that time that Warren Leonard showed that mutations of the common gamma, gamma chain underlie the disease X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency. And so that this was a, a, a cytokine receptor that was shared by the cytokines listed above. And 
in the paper we showed the interaction between JAK3 and comma gamma chain, we made the prediction that, um, that maybe in addition to um, boys who had mutations of the common gamma chain, that there would be boys and girls who had a, a similar clinical phenotype if they had mutations of JAK3. Um, so that prediction turned out to be true. And we collaborated with two groups, uh, Gigi Notarangelo, who at that time was in Brescia, and also uh, Rebecca Buckley, of course, at, at Duke. Um, and um, studying their cohorts of patients, we found that indeed there were patients who had mutations of JAK3 and really it phenocopied very much what um, you see in, in uh, boys who have mutations of the common gamma chain. And so in, in that paper, in the paper that I, we co-authored with Becky Buckley, um, we made this bold claim um, that Bob just uh, mentioned um, was that if you purposely targeted um, uh, JAKs and especially JAK3, we were thinking at the time that you might end up with a new class of um, um, immunomodulatory drugs. So now um, 25 years later, um, that turns out, that prediction turned out, turns out to be true. We have um, a number of JAK inhibitors. These are the approved JAK inhibitors shown here. I'll just uh, go through them very quickly and hit some of the high points. Ruxolitinib was the first FDA approved JAK inhibitor, um, but it was used for the treatment of polycythemia vera, myelic fibrosis, now approved for acute GVHD. Tofacitinib was the drug that came from, from our collaboration with Pfizer, and the intent from the beginning was to treat um, autoimmune diseases and immune mediated diseases. Um, and it's now approved for rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, juvenile arthritis, and ulcerative colitis. Baricitinib is the Lilly drug, um, which you'll hear about more about. It's approved for rheumatoid arthritis um, in the U United States and Europe, approved for treatment of atopic dermatitis in, in Europe. Pefacitinib is a drug that's been approved in Japan. It's a pan-JAK inhibitor approved for rheumatoid arthritis. And there's even a dog JAK inhibitor oh, okay. um, um, that's approved for atopic dermatitis. Um, Fedratinib is um, a, a JAK1 FLT3 inhibitor used for uh, treatment of myelofibrosis. Eupidocitinib um, is a selective inhibitor or, or relatively selective JAK1 inhibitor. I'll come to that in a moment, approved for rheumatoid arthritis. Filgotinib is another selective JAK1 inhibitor, also approved for rheumatoid arthritis in Europe, but not the United States. And delgacitinib is a topical uh, JAK inhibitor approved in, in Japan. Um, I'm gonna quickly summarize some of the other um, um, indications that are being studied with JAK inhibitors. Um, as I mentioned, a number of drugs are being used for various forms of juvenile arthritis, spondyl arthritis, um, dermatomyositis, which of course we'll talk more about. Also for inherited interferonopathies, and importantly, Down syndrome is now um, classified as um, being a, an interferonopathy because actually in, in trisomy 21, you have um, um, overexpression of the interferon receptors and, and the drug is being, JAK inhibitors are being used to treat uh, down, aspects of Down syndrome. Uh, also autoinflammatory diseases, which have been referred to, a variety of dermatological conditions shown here, chronic graft versus host disease, psoriasis, atopic dermatitis I mentioned, Alopeciata is an example where there's some pretty dramatic examples of, of um, treatment with uh, JAK inhibitors, drug-induced hypersensitivity, scleroderma, vitiligo, sarcoidosis, um, GI conditions, including IBD, Crohn's syndrome, and then and, and, and the drug is approved for treatment, the JAK inhibitors approved for treatment of ulcerative colitis, and then also oncologic conditions as well. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that um, JAK inhibitors are being used to treat um, um, cytokine storm in COVID and, and the drug um, with most um, sort of, uh, has been studied most intensively in COVID is baricitinib. And again, it, um, from what um, I told you, you might think it's a little odd to be using uh, an immunosuppressive drug um, in, in a disorder, in a, a viral infection um, and, and um, there was a lot of sort of consideration um, to using these drugs in this setting, but the biggest trial that's now come out is the adaptive trial ACT2 um, in which remdesivir plus or minus baricitinib was used um, in over a thousand subjects. And in fact, it showed significant 
reduction um, in uh, time to recovery um, and, and in, uh, increase, significant increase in clinical improvement. And this is a, a smaller study, but it illustrates the point that um, JAK inhibitors, in fact, um, do appear to be quite efficacious in the treatment of um, COVID-19. Now, in the case of baricitinib, there's discussion as to whether the efficacy of the drug um, relates to inhibition of JAKs or also in um, and, uh, kinases that are involved in the endocytosis of, um, in this case, uh, SARS-CoV-2. And, and that's sort of an open question at the moment, but there are ongoing trials with baricitinib, but also other um, jackanibs that don't have this um, feature of inhibiting um, these enzymes. It does raise the, the broader question um, as to whether JAK inhibitors can be used for other viral infections and also more broadly for acute respiratory distress syndrome. Okay, so back to a little more of the details of the JAK. So there are four JAKs, um, JAK 1, 2, and 3. And then as I mentioned before, um, the sort of odd man out that's, that's a JAK, but it's called, uh, it has a different name. Um, and, and the way JAKs work um, is they mostly work in pairs. Uh, I'll give you a, a, um, a, a circumstance in which JAK2 um, works. Uh, with the hormone-like uh, receptors, but other than that, uh, mostly JAKs work in pairs, and they're critical for, for uh, 57 different cytokines, um, and I, I won't go through all the details of that and sort of just try to hit the high points. Um, uh, as you might imagine, the, when the JAK3 knockout was made in mice, um, you had combined immunodeficiency, just like we identified in the patients and, and with our collaboration with Dr. Buckley and Gigi Notarangelo. JAK2 knockout is embryonically lethal, and that's because of its importance in hematopoiesis. JAK1 knockout is perinatally lethal, and, and it's a little bit unclear as to why that is, but um, probably related to neurologic defects in the mice. TIC2, like JAK3, has um, more selective functions. You have viral susceptibility, um, and, and that's related to impaired signaling by interferons and uh, IL-10 family cytokines, but also IL-12 and IL-23. So no big surprise that uh, the um, complications you see with JAK inhibitors include serious and opportunistic infections. And in particular, herpes zoster uh, is uh, an infection you see with the use of JAKs. But remarkably, um, the, the rate of infections are comparable to what you see with biologics. And in a way, maybe that might be a puzzle to you, given the fact that you're uh, inhibiting so many cytokines with these drugs. But I just remind you that, um, that certainly if you are using JAK inhibitors, you're inhibiting a large number of cytokines, but there are also a number of relevant cytokines that in principle are not being blocked, IL-1, TNF, IL-17, et cetera, um, by, um, by JAK inhibitors. Other uh, side effects include cytopenias that relate to JAK2 inhibition and um, <clears throat> um, increased lipids uh, thought in part to be related to um, IL-6 inhibition, um, but um, the increased lipids uh, at this point are not uh, associated with increased cardiovascular uh, complications. Um, there is some thought that high dose of JAK inhibitors can be associated with uh, uh, venous thrombosis, um, and the mechanism for that is, is still a little bit unclear. Other effects include, include increased creatinine, transaminases, etc. And a concern all along has been because these drugs inhibit um, interferons, it is possible that, that you could have increased incidence of cancer, but again, that hasn't been clearly documented yet. So this is the scorecard, um, just to sort of illustrate where we are now. First inhibition, first generation JAK inhibs um, block a large number of cytokines, as I was alluding to. Um, that include um, common gamma chain cytokines, IL-6 family cytokines, IL-12, and interferons. And now with next generation JAK inhibitors, um, we have the ability to inhibit uh, fewer cytokines and, and have a more focused effect potentially. And, and uh, what we had proposed long ago was that if you inhibited JAK3, you'd have a, 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 the most narrow sort of um, a focused action of, of this class of drugs. Uh, and I'll, I'll comment on that very quickly, um, but the bottom line is 
despite all these drugs with having very broad effects or in principle more narrow effects, um, the efficacy and, and safety of, of this whole class of drugs are, are pretty similar, surprisingly so. Okay, um, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but just maybe show you that this, these are the JAK1 selective um, drugs and they're being studied in, in a wide variety of indications shown here, uh, um, including upadacitinib, filgotinib, idacitinib, and the Pfizer drug, abracitinib. There are two TIC2 selective drugs, again, which would in principle have a, a more narrow um, um, action on, on the number of cytokines and includes BMS drug and a drug um, from Pfizer, Bepracitinib, and again, used in a wide variety of indications. And then also JAK2 selective drugs, largely used um, um, in oncological situations and myeloproliferative neoplasms. Ritlacitinib is an interesting drug. It, it's, it's a JAK3 selective drug, but it also inhibits TEC family kinases. And just to remind you, TEC family kinases are shown here. And maybe one of the most relevant ones is BTK, which is mutated in, in a, a primary immunodeficiency, X-linked agammaglobulin anemia. Um, so you inhibit both cytokine and B cell and T cell receptor signaling. And there are ongoing trials listed here. Um, and some publications um, shown here in, in rheumatoid arthritis. And again, efficacy and, and um, that's similar um, to what is seen with other JAK inhibitors. Another example of a combined inhibitor, um, uh, uh, two examples are gusacitinib and sertilatinib, uh, which are JAK and SICK inhibitors. And just to remind you, SICK uh, kinase is important for B cell receptor signaling, FC receptor signaling, and integrin signaling. And um, two um, phase two trials with gusacitinib have been published in atopic dermatitis and again show efficacy and then safety that's comparable, comparable to other JAK inhibitors. I mentioned top, topical JAK inhibitors, which there are many. There are also absorbable JAK inhibitors for, for GI indications and then inhaled JAK inhibitors being developed for asthma and, and other diseases. So I'll, um, I'll just wrap up with this final slide, which is that um, we still have a number of questions that I think need to be answered. And, and in all the different diseases that we're interested in treating, uh, one would really not, would like to know what cytokines are being inhibited in what cells in, in, a, in a given disease and at which phase of the disease. And, and although we obviously have to have the usual clinical, randomized clinical trials, exactly what dose is what, appropriate for each of the phases of the disease, I think is, is an unanswered question. And then when you combine these questions with uh, the other questions is how you can use JAK inhibitors with other drugs, including steroids, methotrexate, biologics, et cetera. Um, it, it really makes you understand that we, we, it's great that these drugs are efficacious, that they're relatively safe, but I think we have a ways to go before we really are using these drugs as effectively as we can. And it would really be nice if we knew exactly what we needed to measure to ensure um, that we are optimizing the dose and, and, and uh, optimizing efficacy and, and optimizing safety in any given patient. So I'm gonna end right there um, and then stop sharing. Uh, thank you, John. Really, uh, really nice overview um, from the historical perspective and a reminder that um, it, it, it's a whole new vocabulary for us. <laughs> um, it's hard. It's hard to keep up. So there, there, there are a couple of questions. So one um, from uh, Ingrid uh, Pan: When herpes zoster was observed, was it seen in patients who were unvaccinated, um, or was it reactivation of previous infection? Good question. I, the, I, I think the, um, the recommendation at this point is that patients sh should be vaccinated. Um, but um, yes, in, in all the trials, it was I, mostly patients who were, who were not vaccinated in the clinical trials. But I think the recommendation from um, eight, you know, different bodies recommends that patients do get vaccinated. Yeah, so so I'm not yeah I'm not really sure how um, 
protective being vaccinated. It certainly it is it is protective when you're on a jack inhibitor, but I don't know if it's completely protective or not. But so John, um, you, you started to get to, to this in one of your last slides, but when we think about some organ specific diseases, how effective is this inhibition in these organ specific disorders? versus, and I'm not saying myositis is organ specific, I mean, because there's multiple organs, but are you finding that we have some similar effects when people have tried it in, in those diseases versus things that are more hematologic based or you know, maybe immune cell based that are in the periphery? Uh, that's a, it's a really good question. And uh, one thing actually, I, Bob, I forget to mention in the introduction that um, my, uh, my boss at NIH when I first came was, was Mike Frank. So, um, and I just uh, just thought I should mention that that uh, yeah, Mike Frank took me in and and first taught me how to how to be a, a biochemist. Um, anyway, um, I think the the best example to address your question was the uh, jack inhibitors were used in um, first the first indication was in in um, kidney transplant, and and they they worked. Um, but it was in the early days and they um, used very high doses of JAK inhibitors and they used uh, them with multiple other drugs. So efficacy wasn't the problem. Um, the problem was um, with side effects and infection. Um, and they backed off and that's how they ended up um, switching to rheumatoid arthritis and the like. Um, but I, I would think that um, these agents certainly can work in, in organ specific disease. But yeah, you, your point is a good one. Um, it gets down to, you know, it'd be really nice if we could measure stuff. Uh, you know, I, I often say when I give these talks that the, the first biologic was insulin, right? Um, when we, but you, when you, we were giving insulin to patients, we followed a lot of things and we followed them very carefully and we followed them very consistently. Um, and we don't always do that with, um, with both biologics and then targeted therapies. It would be nice if we could do more of that and do it more effectively. It'd be nice to know that it's getting into the areas that are inflamed versus it being, as you say, like a secondary effect where you're having to suppress the whole system in order to get the effects. Right, it's, it's a shame that they didn't pursue kidney transplants more because we could have learned some of those things. Okay, great. I think we'll move on. Thank you again, John, for, for that talk. Um, so our next speaker is Hannah Kim. And um, so Hannah is an assistant clinical investigator in the NIAMS uh, intramural research program. Um, Hannah did her medical training or medical school training at the University of California, Irvine, and then did pediatric residency training at Children's Hospital, Children's National um, in Washington, D.C. She completed a rheumatology fellowship uh, in pediatrics, um, so, sort of a circuitous route, but she spent some of her time at A.I. DuPont Hospital in Wilmington, Delaware, finished at Children's National, and did her research um, in our combined program at the, uh, in NIAMS. So Hannah's now, um, as an assistant clinical investigator, she's now head of the juvenile myositis pathogenesis and therapeutics unit in NIAMS. And she uh, recently led a compassionate use study of baricitinib in refractory juvenile dermatomyositis, which she is going to tell you about um, today. So thank you, Dr. Colbert, for that introduction. And thank you to Kirjim and the organizers for the opportunity to talk about this topic with you today, baricitinib in refractory juvenile dermatomyositis. Here are the disclosures. Um, so just briefly, we're talking about juvenile dermatomyositis all afternoon, but this is a rare systemic autoimmune disease with characteristic rashes, including heliotrope rash and Gautron's papules. There's typically a symmetric proximal myositis that can be seen on MRI here and vasculopathy um, that can be seen um, at the gingiva with these dilated vessels here and at the nail fold capillaries and in other ways that are unseen as well. And we heard a lot from the first talk about um, what's known about the etiology of juvenile dermatomyositis. Um, in particular, it's been well documented that there's an elevated interferon signature that's been shown in adult and juvenile dermatomyositis, in peripheral blood, in muscle, and in skin. 
And these types of markers have been shown to correlate with disease activity. Um, and there are a lot of standard therapies that are used, but still up to 60 to 70% of juvenile dermatomyositis patients have a chronic or polycyclic disease course. We just heard from Dr. O'Shea in detail about the JAK inhibitors. I just include this briefly to say that there are many cytokines or cell signaling molecules that use JAK or stats, JAK stats to signal. But in particular, we were interested in them because they, it includes type 1 and type 2 interferons. So I'll be talking about the use of baricitinib in refractory juvenile dermatomyositis. So when interferon binds the receptor, this activates the JAKs and they phosphorylate and activate the stats that phosphorylate and dimerize and go to the nucleus and tell the cell's nucleus to transcribe interferon-specific regulated genes, and that leads to translation of interferon-regulated proteins and more production of interferon with an amplification loop. So when a JAK inhibitor, such as baricitinib, is introduced, this blocks this um, action of, at the receptor level and uh, we believe also would stop downstream signaling. So I'll be talking about a study, a compassionate use study that we had at NIAMS for refractory juvenile dermatomyositis to access baricitinib. There was uh, another report about a juvenile dermatomyositis patient and that improved with baricitinib, but I'll be focusing on the, four, uh, the patients we saw at NIAMS. So for this study, the patients had to meet standard Bohan and Peter criteria for probable or definite juvenile dermatomyositis. They had to be able to complete muscle assessments so that we could accurately reflect change in that status. And they had to be active by validated corset measures despite um, already trying standard therapies, specifically including steroids of at least one milligram per kilogram per day or 60 milligrams a day for a month. And they needed to have an adequate trial of at least two other immunosuppressive medications or immunomodulatory medications and at least one of those had to be a biologic. So for example, if they were still active after a standard dose of steroids, methotrexate, and IVIG, they could be qualified for this study. And some of the key exclusion criteria were um, having had herpes simplex virus recently, a history of herpes zoster, any history of HIV, hepatitis B or hepatitis C, any history of lymphoproliferative disease, having tuberculosis or a house of contact with TB, exposure to a live vaccine within 12 weeks, or low renal function. The structure of this study was that we had an initial screening visit with close assessment of inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then um, we saw the patients at baseline and then follow up every four weeks until 12 weeks and then every 12 weeks after that. And the baricitinib in the study was dosed based on weight and renal function based on estimated glomerular filtration rate. And there was an option to escalate dose based on safety and efficacy. So there were four patients that we enrolled into this study, three of which were female. Um, the, the patients all were positive for a myositis specific antibody, two who had anti-TIF1 and two had anti-NXP2 and they were between five and 20 years of age when they started baricitinib. And um, the average disease duration was about six years. And the baricitinib dosing with this um, oral tablet was between four and eight milligrams per day divided BID. So this, the patients were, the baricitinib for these patients was added on to other therapies. So all the patients we're also on daily oral prednisone between 5 and 21 milligrams per day, or on average 0.28 milligrams per kilogram per day. And they were on two to three other steroids varying agents. All four of the patients were still on IVIG, and then a, a combination of the other medications listed here, mycophenolate, methotrexate, tacrolimus, and cyclosporin. They were required to wash out any other biologic agents other than IVIG, and other previous medications included rituximab, Basep, methotrexate, and cyclosporin. 
So when we assess these patients at 24 weeks, we saw significant clinical improvement by multiple measures. Um, first, I'm showing physician global activity. So this is an assessment done by the physician or clinician um, based on a zero to 10 visual analog scale with a higher number reflecting higher activity. So overall in all four patients, we see a decrease in this value over time. And it's shown at baseline and at four, eight, 12 and 24 weeks. And this was a significant decrease by week four. And then also when the patient or parent assess the global activity, we see a similar pattern where there is a decrease after starting baricitinib and over time. And this was also significant by week four. We assessed all of the patients by manual muscle testing to assess their strength. So we use the MMT8 out of 150. So a higher number on this scale would in indicate greater strength and a lower number increased weakness or lower strength. So at baseline, only two of our four patients had notable weakness, but those two patients did demonstrate an increase by week four and eight. And this was a clinically relevant improvement that was demonstrated. The other two patients were not significantly weak at baseline and maintained their strength throughout. And for skin disease activity, we utilize the CDASI, a dermatomyositis specific skin activity assessment tool to, um, to measure their skin disease activity with a higher score indicating higher activity. So with this assessment, we also saw a decrease over time and this was statistically significant by week four. We assessed the patients by magnetic resonance imaging or MRI of the thighs. And this was also uh, graded or scored by a radiologist who was blinded to the time point in the study. So on um, for the two patients that were weak at baseline, you can see that there's some increased inflammation, particularly in the anterior compartments for this individual and more on one side for the other individual. And there's also some increased white or inflammation edema around the fascia for this person on the left. So they were scored with higher score indicating more edema. Um, 18 out of 20 for this person on the left and 4 out of 20 for the person on the right. And then at 24 weeks, a follow-up MRI shows improvement in the inflammation or edema that was previously seen. And both of them scored 0 out of 20 at that time point. And then to visually see some of the skin findings, um, each of these is showing different patients and an example skin finding. So heliotrope rash and some malar rash is shown for the first patient around the eyes and nose. And the second patient has a significant B sign rash with dark erythema and scale present. This person has dilated nail fluid capillaries with some tortuosity. And this fourth patient had a violaceous erythematous rash on the lateral thigh and leg. And then after 24 weeks of treatment, you see improvement in the heliotrope and malar rash. While this V-sign rash is still present, there's decreased erythema and scale, and also the size is smaller. The nail fluid capillaries appear more regular and less dilated and tortuous, and there's improvement in this leg rash as well. We assess the improvement in these patients also by the ACR ULAR total improvement score. So this utilizes the six core disease activity measures and calculates the exact percentage of improvement and weights them based on that percentage improvement. And each of these core set measures is weighted differently of note, the, the strength core set measure, MMT in our case, is weighted most heavily with the highest potential for score or points to be accumulated. So in our four patients, you can see that all four patients were able to accumulate points and increase their score over time. But as far as meeting the thresholds for minimal, moderate, and major improvement, the two patients who had weakness at baseline and uh, thus had more potential to accumulate points, were able to meet minimal improvement by week four and, and then moderate improvement by week and afterwards.
Regarding other immunosuppressive medications, um, for the prednisone, some of our patients were able to decrease their prednisone. So overall, there was a decrease in the steroid exposure for these patients after starting baricitinib. And with other medications, there were some that were also able to be stopped or decreased in dose. So there was a patient that was able to stop tacrolimus, a different patient was able to stop methotrexate, and then different patients were able to decrease their IV steroids and mycophenolate doses. Other testing that we did included pharmacokinetic testing. So we did time testing of drug levels after starting baricitinib to better um, study the pharmacokinetics in this population, which hadn't previously been studied. And then we looked at pharmacodynamic markers to try and assess if the JAK inhibitor was working on the cells or the interferon signaling pathway that we expected. So we studied interferon alpha STAT1 phosphorylation, which is very proximal to the site of action of Janus kinases or JAKs on the interferon regulated gene expression and then IP10 and interferon related protein. So first in looking at interferon alpha stimulated STAT1 phosphorylation, we looked at how active that phosphorylation was directly in correlation to the level of the drug or baricitinib level in the blood. So we're hoping to see less SAT phosphorylation with a higher drug level. And we looked at this in different cell types. So first, this is showing CD4 and CD8 T cells. And with this best fit curve, you can see the trend that we expected as the drug level or baricitinib level increases. The Interferon alpha stimulated STAT1 phosphorylation decreases. And we saw a similar pattern with monocytes and B cells. But we, we saw this effect uh, of decreasing STAT1 phosphorylation more in the CD4 and CD8 T cells. We also looked at interferon regulated gene expression, so the RRG score. In all four of the patients, we saw an elevated score at baseline and they decreased in all patients by the week four assessment. In three of the patients, the score reduced to the healthy control range. Um, there was one patient who had an of suspected viral infection at this time point. This was not associated with any change in their disease activity or suspicion for increased myositis or skin disease activity. Um, however, uh, as one might expect with a viral infection, we know interferon is one of the main responses to viruses. So this elevation in interferon score likely represents a physiologic response to that infection. And similarly with IP10 interferon related protein, we saw that all were elevated at baseline and decreased by week four. It's more difficult to see in this graphic because they're overlapping, but that same patient who had the suspected viral infection did have an increased level at week 12, the same time point, um, but it remained within the healthy control range. Regarding safety by 24 weeks, there were no serious adverse events over this time point in our four patients, and none of the patients had to hold or discontinue baricitinib due to an adverse event. Infection was the most common adverse event that we saw, and upper respiratory infection was the most common infection. As a BK virus uh, was previously reported in interferonopathies who had been studied with baricitinib, we monitored this in our patients as well. There was one patient who had BK virus in the blood prior to starting baricitinib, and it had an increase in titer after starting, and there was another patient who developed BK virus in the urine after starting, but this wasn't clinically significant for uh, any of our patients and none of our patients developed any pathology related to BK virus. There are some differences in cell counts that we observed. And as we heard about, this is a common side effect that has been reported with JAK inhibitors. So there were patients that were observed to develop anemia, thrombocytosis, neutropenia, and lymphopenia. Interestingly, um, as these were myositis patients, we were monitoring muscle enzymes closely, and there was some elevation of some muscle enzymes in some of our patients. There wasn't a consistent pattern, but this elevation was not associated with any significant change or increase in disease activity. 
any changes in strength by our assessments or any change on MRI. It was also not associated with any reported symptoms by our patients. Um, of note, CK has been uh, reported to be elevated with varicidinib previously. Regarding the pharmacokinetics, um, we know that this drug, varicitinib, is renally cleared, and we utilize the dosing use in interferonopathies, um, which is based on weight and renal function, as mentioned. And our dosing, and this dosing and in these patients um, results in a greater drug exposure than the standard adult RA dosing. Four milligrams had been studied prior to the development of that dosing, but now it's approved for two milligrams a day. Um, overall, we generally saw a shorter half-life of the drug in the lower weight category that we had and a longer half-life with lower renal function, which makes sense as we know that it's renally cleared. And overall, the pharmacokinetic parameters were similar to what had been previously reported in Mendelian interferonopathies. So in conclusion, for our four patients uh, with baricitinib with refractory juvenile dermatomyositis, we observed clinical efficacy uh, despite being treatment refractory to multiple other treatments. They had um, improvement based on multiple validated core disease activity measures. And the two that had weakness at that baseline had clinically significant improvement in their strength, also demonstrated on MRI. And they, those two were able to meet improvement by ACR ULAR criteria. And some of our patients were also able to decrease daily oral steroids and or decrease or stop other immunosuppressants. Baricitinib was generally well tolerated, though monitoring for infections and cell counts will be important. And muscle enzymes, particularly the elevations that I mentioned, did not necessarily correlate with changes in strength. We saw dose-dependent decreases in stat phosphorylation, and as well as decreases that were significant in interferon gene scores and IP10, which confirm the action of baricitinib along the interferon pathway as we expected. And the pharmacokinetics we observed in these refractory juvenile dermatomyositis patients was similar to previously reported in Mendelian interferonopathies. And overall, we, we believe baricitinib is an exciting treatment opportunity in refractory juvenile dermatomyositis warranting further study. I'd like to thank the NIAMS clinical team, particularly Robert Colbert, who we worked together to study these patients with, um, and dermatology, also the translational immunology section to help us do those assessments, and Lisa Ryder, who's a close collaborator for the study. We worked with Eli Lilly, who provided drug and did the PK assessments. And I'd like to thank all the patients, families, and the referring physicians for participating in the study. And I'm happy to take any questions. Um, there are a couple of questions popping up. Um, uh, so are these data incurred from uh, Dr. Uh, Hakan Arson? Are these data encouraging enough for Lilly NIH to pursue a formal clinical trial? Um, so Hannah? Um, so we are in the process of starting an investigator initiated study to further further study baricitinib and juvenile dermatomyositis with baricitinib. And a follow-up question related to a trial, what would be your primary endpoint? Should this move toward a pivotal trial? Um, so that's the next question. We are thinking of using the, the total improvement score based on the ACR ULAR approved response criteria. So maybe also you wanna comment, since this was refractory disease, um, uh, how how one might think about treatment um, given the current um, sort of established approach to patients? Um, as far as like when it should be used? Um, yeah. I mean, I think all of the patients that we had were quite refractory as we heard about. Um, I think there is interest at least and some optimism within our group about potentially using it earlier in disease. Um, we don't have a good way of identifying which, for which people this would be the best treatment for, but I think we could, I think it would be useful and warranted to try and study baricitinib earlier in disease. And let's see, 
Another couple of questions. Any increase in adverse events of subjects by history before treatment? Uh, so I think a bit kind of a baseline assessment of AEs. So we didn't look at that specifically, like compare to historical events that could be similar to adverse events on prior treatment, but that would be interesting to look at. I mean, I think that just recalling some of these patients, um, I think that some of the AEs that you get um, after someone becomes more active um, are maybe related to improvement and not related to drug as, as an example. Um, so one of the other questions, uh, I think the question about how early in disease course might you suggest starting it, I think that's, um, I, I think we've sort of addressed that, uh, although certainly there's, th that's a topic that could be discussed more. Um, another important question from Ann Stevens, what is the mechanism for thrombocytosis and does this raise concern given vasculopathy and JDM? I, I think that's something that's been discussed and to my understanding is not fully understood. I don't, Dr. O'Shea could weigh in as well. Yeah, we heard a presentation from Roy Fleischman right two weeks ago and I think exactly whether it's, it's a true risk or, or an apparent risk is, is unclear and, and certainly the mechanism is it's not entirely um, understood. Yeah, thank you. I think there uh, was a question, sorry, also about ahead. calcinosis and I meant to mention. So mm -hmm. there were two, were two of the patients that had calcinosis um, and we didn't have like a very, any stringent assessment of that calcinosis over time, but there was no significant change in the calcinosis in this study. Um, but that could be interpreted also as a positive as there was no progression of the calcinosis and no new calcinosis lesions. And a question that I think um, you might, well, one related to JDM with IL-17-RA mutation. So IL-17 receptor mutation, would you recommend a JAK inhibitor? Um, well, I, I don't believe IL-17 is so closely blocked by JAK inhibitors, Right. but I, I think that would be interesting to study. Good, you dodged that, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a hard one to answer and, and whether, uh, obviously whether the JDM is truly related to the mutation and, um, but you might still get benefit, but anyway. Right. And then uh, just a couple of other questions, and then I think we should move on. There are two here, one related to clarification of the manifestations of juvenile dermatomyositis in the two patients that, who weren't weak um, and, and sort of clarifying how they did show improvement. So for those patients, it was primarily in their skin disease. Okay, thanks. And then a comment um, from Ar Ar Arat Patel, uh, used Zeljans off-label in a number of adults with refractory DM, mostly rash, great responses. Um, the few kids I've used it in also responded. Um, anecdotally, the muscles have not improved as much. Uh, look forward to more data in both DM and, and JDM. So thank, thank you for the comment. So uh, that's good. Hannah, thank you very much um, for uh, presenting those, those results and for all your hard work on, the, um, on this uh, topic and also what you're planning going forward. Uh, let's see, our final speaker of this morning's session is um, uh, Charlie Cow, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, you can, you can correct me. But Dr. Cow is a translational research scientist at the Center for Applied Genomics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, Dr. Cow received his PhD from the University of Minnesota in uh, molecular, cellular, and developmental biology and genetics with an emphasis in immunology. And he joined the center in 2011 uh, with his current focus on the development of new therapeutics uh, and informative biomarkers from uh, genes and pathways discovered through genome-wide association studies uh, in a number of disorders, including inflammatory and autoimmune conditions. 
uh, and Dr. Cao is gonna, the title of his talk is SOX1 Mimetic Peptide as a Novel Jack Inhibitor for Potential Treatment of Juvenile Myositis. Great, looks like slides are up and Great, I will mute, mute myself and you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction also for uh, Cure JM in uh, hosting and giving me the opportunity to present just a matter of disclosure. Uh, I am a co-founder and uh, uh, co-owner of uh, Arctic Therapeutics that's actually developing the SOX1 cure uh, jack inhibitor. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. And uh, so uh, the talk here is, uh, is going to describe a novel uh, jack inhibitor and our uh, efforts to position this as a potential um, uh, treatment and we're focused uh, specifically in uh, JDM. Next slide. So I'm actually uh, giving this uh, talk on behalf of the Center for Applied Genomics. It's uh, one of the centers of emphasis at the Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia. Uh, it was originally founded close to 15 years ago now uh, by uh, Dr. Halpin Narsen, uh, who's on the uh, lower right uh, picture there and is still uh, the current active uh, director of the center. And uh, we have, um, our efforts are uh, to recruit patients from that visit the uh, Children's Hospital every year. And to date, we've uh, collected or recruited about uh, 100,000 uh, kids and their families into the, this database and uh, making it one of the largest uh, pediatric biobanks and certainly for pediatrics, uh, the largest of its kind in that it couples not only the, um, the genomic data or sample that we collect from them, but also marry that to their phenotype based off of their uh, uh, clinical history from their electronic medical records. And on top of that, uh, these records are longitudinal and they're actively added to as a um, uh, visit shop uh, from the future, uh, from the point onwards and by past and also future after they've uh, consented to the study. And uh, on top of that, we also do have consent to be able to go back to recontact them for uh, additional follow-up or clinical trials or other research studies in the, the vast majority of, of the patients. And uh, one of our uh, areas of uh, intense focus is on the uh, various uh, autoimmune and inflammatory disorders, including um, the common ones you see in kids, as well as some of the more rare ones like uh, juvenile dermatomyositis. Uh, next slide, please. Dr. Cao, can, sorry to yes. interrupt you. Uh, I have a request. Um, if you could make your slides a little bigger. I noticed it's a PDF and I'm not sure if you can, but if you can, yeah, that would be great. Appreciate it. Yeah, I, I'm not uh, controlling the slides, unfortunately, so they can, that's great. Yep, that looks okay, good, uh, thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, so the, uh, the Children's Hospital is actually right next door or uh, pretty much located on the University of Pennsylvania campus. And there is a lot of uh, crosstalk and uh, collaborative efforts between uh, CHOP as well as, uh, uh, as, well as Penn, and especially uh, in various uh, studies where we're uh, doing equivalency type of comparisons in um, uh, certain disorders that are present in pediatrics and also uh, found in adults. And uh, uh, for adult studies, there's often a lot of collaboration then uh, to work on uh, with the Penn side uh, um, uh, for follow-up. Next slide, please. So uh, our uh, interest in juvenile dermatomyosis in particular began uh, about close to three years ago now uh, when uh, we were first introduced to the uh, CureJM uh, Foundation. And uh, kind of serendipitously, um, we had uh, set up this archetype therapeutics uh, structure in order to be able to pursue uh, uh, business development and uh, translational development uh, of potential new therapies that uh, from targets or um, uh, new modalities that we discovered at, uh, uh, at CAG and also elsewhere to then be able to take into uh, uh, future clinical trials and then to, uh, with business development as well. And one of the ones of areas of interest was actually this uh, SOX1 cure mimetic peptide that uh, was introduced to with a, a former colleague uh, when I was in postdoc days and then who went off to the University of Florida. And uh, the original interest actually in the SOX1 cure was because one of the main uh, genome-wide association study uh, targets that came up was the uh, 16P1313 locus that includes a number of genes, including CLEC16A, 
SOX1 in particular, as well as uh, um, class 2 transactivator gene. And this particular locus has been implicated now across, I think, um, uh, 20 or so different autoimmune diseases from a genetic association uh, standpoint. And so there was a lot of interest to study uh, a peptide or a um, uh, therapeutic that then uses this uh, uh, SOX1 or at least a modality in order to uh, pursue as a treatment for various autoimmune disease. And because of the uh, interest in JAK inhibitors uh, in general, as well as uh, a number of clinical studies showing its efficacy in, um, uh, in a juvenile dermatomyositis, about a year or so ago, we started to look more actively in uh, tr transitioning the development of uh, SOX1 cure uh, specifically for uh, dermatomyositis. Next slide, please. And so um, I won't belabor the, uh, the type 1 interferon uh, signaling pathway again, except to highlight the fact that besides uh, the activation uh, pathway going through JAKS and then uh, phosphorylation of staph and so forth, what's also upregulated as part of the interferon response is the upregulation uh, of uh, certain neg negative regulatory molecules, uh, including this, and this is uh, SOX1. And so uh, we already know that uh, JAK inhibitors uh, have been uh, developed as a way to dampen inflammation to various cytokine signals, including type 1 interferon signaling, but that there are actually naturally evolved uh, negative regulators that the body produces as well that uh, binds to JAK's stats as a, a negative um, mode of, uh, uh, of regulation for the, for the pathway. Next slide, please. And so the SOX family, or the suppressor of cytokine signaling family, uh, uh, comprises about eight different uh, proteins, and uh, they are naturally evolved uh, protein negative regulators of uh, various inflammatory uh, signals, including receptor tyrosine kinases and cytokine receptors. The ones we want to focus in particular are the SOX1 and SOX3 uh, members of this uh, family. and. Uh, and the, in particular, there's a domain towards the internal uh, uh, interim, and it's called the uh, cure or kinase inhibitory region that actually uh, has a specific and high affinity for its target genes, in this case, the JAKs and the SATs, and that actually uh, prevents uh, the transactivation and the, the binding of substrates uh, and, uh, and it serves as well the, one of the busy ends of the molecule in uh, inhibiting uh, its uh, target proteins, in this case, the JAK stats. Now, I should emphasize that uh, besides the cure domain, the other ends of the molecules, for example, the SH2 domain, uh, also then facilitate target mining. And the SOX box domain near the uh, C terminus actually is, uh, 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 functions as an E3 uh, ubiquitin ligase that then helps to uh, mark these uh, target proteins uh, bound by the cure domain and SH2 domain to then uh, uh, ubiquitate them, to then uh, designate them for proteosomal degradation. So there is actually multiple mechanisms, mechanisms by which uh, the SOX uh, family proteins then uh, um, carry out its negative regulatory functions, but we are essentially going to focus on just the actions of the cure domain for, uh, for drug development. Um, next slide, please. So uh, it kind of uh, it summarizes that uh, there are actually multiple mechanisms by which these SOX proteins uh, then negatively regulate, uh, for example, uh, JAK stats, and then that we're uh, also should emphasize that besides JAKs and RTKs, there's also the SOX uh, one protein also can negatively regulate TLR uh, and NF kappa uh, B signaling also. But since these are all uh, again mediated more by the uh, SH2 and uh, Sox box domains, they don't apply uh, as uh, or is not as relevant for our discussions uh, here. Next slide, please. So, in regards to the Sox 1 cure domain, it's about a 15 uh, mer uh, peptide region and it binds directly to the activation loop of JAK1, JAK2, as well as TIC2, uh, with a much less affinity for uh, JAK3. And by its action, uh, it can also bind uh, both the phosphor and unphosphorylated forms uh, of the uh, JAK proteins, and then through this action, then prevent the uh, action of the JAKs to then uh, subsequently uh, bind its downstream uh, targets. So, uh, in order to make this into a drug, we've also uh, then palmitolated the N-terminus uh, 
to then essentially attach a lipophilic region to then facilitate uh, penetration of the uh, peptide across uh, some membranes. And that um, there's also a monomeric form as well as a dimeric form uh, where then the flexible linker is used to attach the one C-terminus end of one cure sequence to the N-terminus of a se second cure, uh, cure sequence. And I'll um, uh, discuss a little later the reason why uh, 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 we're pursuing development of a dimeric version of the uh, molecule uh, to then improve its uh, potency. So uh, on top of that, this um, cure domain then uh, with this uh, modified um, uh, palmetto later form then functions as a JAK inhibitor in multiple models and assays of uh, inflammation. Ne next slide, please. So in particular with uh, juvenile myositis, we've heard a number of uh, talks already uh, demonstrating that uh, it's uh, utility and efficacy uh, as a treatment for juvenile my myositis, including as a refract uh, for refractory cases. And that uh, to date there's been uh, many, many studies, uh, uh, small uh, or uh, case series or uh, small clinical studies showing that uh, it does seem to demonstrate uh, efficacy and could be something that would be worth exploring and that some clinicians have also been prescribing it uh, off-label and ha have seen um, very uh, positive uh, uh, developments uh, with its use. And on top of that, there is the potential to couple use of these jacket inhibitors with uh, the, this type 1 interferon signature and that uh, as with many other rheumatic diseases uh, a large subset of uh, cases do seem to uh, show the upregulation of type 1 uh, markers uh, both in blood and in the um, muscles themselves and that uh, uh, potentially these uh, the interferon activity then could be used as a uh, biomarkers and then guide and inform on the use of uh, JAK inhibitors or possibly to then identify those that are most likely to respond to JAK inhibitors. Now, um, in terms of clinical efficacy, I don't think that there's as much dispute that uh, these uh, JAK inhibitors are going to be highly uh, useful and that they uh, represent a promising and very attractive new modality for treatment. But uh, in terms from a, the it's expanding its wide use as the bottlenecks actually comes more from a business development side. Uh, next slide, please. So even though there are a number of jack inhibitors that are already in late stage ML and more reapproved, uh, most of these are, well, pretty much all of these have been being developed for other indications than that. Uh, most ones, uh, the people that have already developed these uh, jack inhibitors for others sometimes are reluctant to then expose the uh, the drugs to um, the, their established franchises to new risk, especially for rare and orphan uh, type disorders. And uh, it becomes a particular issue just because uh, uh, that's new, uh, it's a new drug status. These are uh, the price point on these are often very high and without a specific uh, approval for uh, the indications like for dermat uh, dermatomyositis, getting it reimbursed uh, by insurance companies then becomes an issue. And on top of that, there's uh, still also concerns that uh, how best to manage the toxicity of this new class of drugs, especially for uh, pediatric cases. So in order to try to address some of these, I think uh, this is kind of our rationale then for why uh, there's, um, uh, in, or there should be interest to then develop a new JAK inhibitor specifically for JDM. And in terms of mi mi mitigating or potentially uh, trying to manage the risk, uh, perhaps then uh, also develop a topical version to then uh, use specifically for patients with refractory skin disease, as well as to develop uh, biomarker-based uh, assessments to then couple the use of the JAK inhibitor so that we potentially uh, apply it only for those that are most likely to respond, for example, those with a certain uh, high level of uh, type 1 interferon uh, signature already present. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so then the goal then uh, um, is for us uh, at this point to then try to take Sox1 cure this mimetic peptide to develop as a, both systemic and topical forms as a new JAK inhibitor specifically for uh, juvenile myositis. Next slide, please. So in the rest of the talk, I'll focus on some of the preclinical data that's been generated to date, uh, demonstrating the anti-inflammatory eff uh, effects of this uh, Sox1 cure mimetic peptide. And these uh, studies were actually conducted by uh, Joel Larkin down at the University of Florida, as well as um, the some large animal studies collected by uh, Karen Plummer, also at University of Florida. Uh, 
Next slide, please. So one of the uh, models that was used uh, is the lupus prone ML MRL LPR uh, model, where these uh, animals then develop certain rashes as well as lymphadenopathy and other symptoms uh, characteristics of uh, lupus-like disease. And um, uh, these animals then spontaneously start to develop skin lesions like uh, shown in the picture here. And so in these animals, if you then treat them early on with the sasox one tier mimetic, then the uh, prevalence and the uh, timing of development of these skin lesions then is significantly reduced. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of uh, besides skin rashes, if you then monitor the develop a, a lymphadenopathy and also progression to morbidity or uh, death, the uh, present the, the treatment with um, uh, with a sasquatch treatment medic that significantly re reduces uh, this morbidity associated with the lymphadenopathy. Next slide, please. So in addition to that, uh, this has also been used in an experimental autoimmune encephalitis model, EAE, which is a mouse a model mimicking uh, multiple sclerosis uh, in humans. And so this uses a, a susceptible SJL uh, mice strain where uh, they are then challenged with uh, myelin basic protein emulsified uh, in a, um, an adjuvant uh, CFA on top of uh, injection with uh, pertussis toxin. And so um, the, what happens in these animals is that they then get sensitized to these myelin basic proteins and then start to mount an inflammatory autoimmune response against uh, the CNS. And so usually by day 12 in the disease progression of this model, you start to see then infiltration of uh, lymphocytes into the brain starting at around day 12. And by day 12, then this is when uh, the animals are then treated with uh, either uh, um, a vehicle alone or with a soxone cure mimetic or the soxone cure uh, A modified peptide, which then significantly attenuates the, the activity of the peptide because of uh, a mutation in one of the critical uh, um, critical residues. And then uh, here's just a, uh, a summary of the staging used in order to score the severity of the disease in these animals. And uh, long story short, just that if you then uh, treat these EDE animals, then with the Soxman cure, you can uh, significantly reduce the uh, severity of the disease uh, in the animals. Next, next slide, please. In addition to that, if we take the uh, SOX1 cure knockouts, which develop spontaneous autoimmune, lethal autoimmune disease, uh, these animals will typically start to die uh, by about uh, three weeks. And that if you treat these animals then with just the peptide alone or with a, a CD4 T cells infusion, which helps to uh, then um, replace the reg uh, regulatory T cells that are lost in these uh, SOX1 uh, uh, deletion or knockout animals. Uh, treatment alone with either of these two modalities then doesn't really help to uh, um, uh, alleviate disease in any way. However, if you combine the infusion of uh, re regulatory T cells along with the SOX1 cure mimetic, you can then see, start to see then uh, a reduction or at least a, a attenuation in the uh, severity or disease development of these uh, SOX1 knockouts. Next slide, please. And then if, uh, just by uh, uh, measure of morbidity by the animal weight, you can see that in these uh, SOX1 knockouts, the animals uh, are pretty small and they start to develop a uh, uh, pretty severe uh, morbidity by about two, three weeks and that you can attenuate much of that or at least uh, to a certain extent by the infusion of uh, back of uh, regulatory T cells as well as uh, the administration of the SOX1 cure mimetic. Uh, next slide, please. And on top of that, uh, there's also an, an amiquinod-induced murinosteriasis model. And uh, what's important here, uh, aside from uh, the administration of the Soxman here, uh, emphasizes that this, uh, the modality here is uh, administered topically. So these animals then uh, develop a psoriasis-like disease with lesions here that I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, but on the top series here, the, um, the animals that start to develop these uh, uh, large lesions as a response to the Mequinod challenge. However, if you treat these animals topically uh, in uh, basically just uh, the mimetic peptide uh, 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 solubilized in uh, PBS and then applied as a, uh, essentially with an eyedropper, uh, 
on these animals, you can then uh, start to reduce the uh, severity of both the erythemia and also the scaling that you and the formation of the lesions in these animals significantly by just the topical administration of the sox one cure uh, peptide. Next slide, please. So another uh, model, uh, a topical model for uh, demonstrating the use of the mimetic peptide is uh, in um, horse recurring u uveitis, which actually we uh, found out later on was uh, through the uh, uh, through the collaboration that it actually is a very serious veterinary issue with horses, especially in certain uh, breeds of horses like the Appaloosas were about as much as uh, uh, one in 10 of uh, horses in, um, from that background then develop uh, recurring uveitis. And that currently the treatments here uh, was uh, for, for these animals is uh, with just uh, steroids or with antibiotics. However, uh, many of the animals uh, that goes blind because of uh, uveitis, they didn't just get sacrificed and that there have, have not actually been any significant new treatments for this disease uh, for quite a while. And uh, we use this model then to then explore the use of uh, uh, topical administration of a JAK inhibitor uh, as a potential new treatment. And uh, if you can see here um, with these animals uh, that have uveitis, what, you, uh, what they um, develop are this uh, uh, hyperemia, which is the presence of blood vessels and uh, redness that you can see uh, around uh, the whites of the eyes as well as uh, protein deposits that form within the uh, pupils and that uh, treatment with uh, uh, as eye drops with a jack inhibitor, in, case, in this case, the sox one cure mimetic, uh, significantly reduces both the discomfort uh, measured by uh, a, a, a cl uh, global clinical response score, uh, as well as the objective measures uh, based off of the amount of hyperemia or blood bloodshotness you see in the eyes, as well as the uh, aqueous flaring uh, and the uh, deposit that you see well, with the uh, uh, course of the disease. And both of these, or all of these measures are significantly reduced by uh, topical eye drop administration with uh, uh, mimetic peptide. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the other uh, uh, point that uh, we kind of just alluded to previously was that uh, besides the monomeric form of SOX1 here, there's also a uh, dimeric form. and uh, in these in vitro model stimulation models where we take a uh, um, uh, uh, CD4, CD8 T cells uh, isolated ex vivo and then stimulate them in culture with uh, CD3 and CD28, uh, you see that uh, these cells then start to proliferate or develop uh, and memory or activated phenotype. And that if you administer the either the SOX1 cure uh, dimer or monomer, you can then reduce the uh, activation phenotype of. Uh, both uh, forms of uh, lymphocytes. And uh, one of the suggested things that came out uh, from this uh, initial kind of proof of concept in vitro study was that the dimer seems to have an outsized role in reducing uh, CD4 uh, T cell or NCD T cell activation beyond just uh, the, the mass effects of having a dimer being uh, two times more uh, of the uh, SOX1 cure sequence compared to the monomer. And not showing it here, but that uh, when you follow this uh, study up in vivo, uh, for example, in the lupus pro model, you can see that, and then you control for the mass size differences between the monomer and dimer. Uh, what you see is that the dimeric form seems to have a uh, synergistic uh, effect of uh, reducing uh, uh, jack activity beyond what the uh, beyond what the monomer can do, and that does make sense, just because knowing about um, cytokine uh, signaling, uh, they, they often, and, and JAK uh, SNAP function is that they do function as a dimer. And so if you put in a dimeric form that pre has a pre-assembled uh, 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 SOX1 cure sequences that can then basically lock in both uh, or two different uh, uh, receptors at the same time, that that uh, could, uh, at least uh, in theory, would uh, then explain why there's an additional potency above and beyond just the mass effects when using a dimer compared to the monomer. Uh, next slide, please. So with that observation, then our uh, focus on development then going forward is going to be with the dimeric form uh, for SOX1 here. And so the next step will be, since this is a new uh, JAK, um, um, or new drug candidate, is to go through the necessary IND enabling studies 
uh, in order to make this into a, um, uh, a uh, drug candidate, candidate that we can then take into clinical human uh, studies. And so that involves, for example, making a GMP cell lie for the dimeric form of the uh, SOX1 cure uh, mimic peptide, as well as then also optimizing the topical formulation to then promote uh, penetration across the skin, as well as then performing the uh, necessary uh, PK and uh, tox studies uh, in small and large animals as well as then uh, completing the dermatological uh, toxicity studies that we would need to do in order to develop a topical formulation for the JAK, uh, for, for the new JAK inhibitor. Next slide, please. And that, yes, and that will conclude my talk. I just wanted to acknowledge again the Center for Life Genomics and uh, Dr. Avinas in particular, who uh, leads the center, as well as uh, also acknowledge uh, um, the colleagues at the University of Florida who carried out the preclinical uh, efficacy modeling studies for the SOX1 cure, and uh, we're the first ones to really uh, uh, characterize the, uh, the, the SOX1 cure uh, mimetic peptide as a form of, uh, uh, as a uh, potential new form of uh, JAK inhibition, as well as, of course, uh, the uh, CareJM Foundation for uh, supporting some of this work, as well as the, um, uh, uh, as well as help uh, hosting and uh, providing opportunity to give the talk today. And uh, with that, I'll close and then take or we'll try to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, it, it certainly looks uh, promising and, and interesting. Um, I don't see any questions right right now. Let me just ask again, and you, I apologize, you may have mentioned this at the beginning, but in terms of this um, selectivity of, the, of SOX1 for um, type 1 interferons versus other responses. Can you just remind me what, um, what other pathways SOX1 is particularly um, important for downregulating? Well, the SOX1 cure domain, uh, peptide domain in particular, binds JAK1, JAK2, and TIC2, and uh, to a lesser extent also JAK3, although the affinity is uh, a couple word magnitude uh, less for JAK3. And and do you have do you know that it equally inhibits those those jacks? Um, it, you know, yeah, actually so for in jack vitro? one, yeah. So there are crystal structure modeling studies of uh, SOX1 protein as well as uh, in vitro uh, uh, binding studies for so jack one, two, and tick two uh, have similar binding affinities and uh, IC50 values, and uh, uh, whereas JAK3 then is also uh, is a couple order of magnitude uh, less less efficient at mm -hmm. uh, inhibiting. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Any other questions? Um, I don't see any in the chat box. Any anybody who wants to unmute and ask a question, I think could. No, I'm not. I'm not seeing any other questions right now. So I'd like to uh, thank you for that talk and thanks to all of our speakers in uh, in session one. The next two sessions um, are going to be chaired by um, a long-standing member of the Cure Jam Medical Advisory Board, um, Professor Anne Reid, um, also a key member of our Duke um, Center of Excellence. Um, uh, Professor Reid um, had a fellowship in molecular genetics from the University of Chicago, um, an immunology and rheumatology fellowship from the Department of Pediatrics at Northwestern University. Uh, residency at the Department of Pediatrics at Akron Children's Hospital and an MD from the Medical College of Ohio. Um, and Professor Reed, as I said, is um, both Professor of Pediatrics and Chair of the Department of Pediatrics at Duke University. And I will hand it over to Anne to chair the next two sessions. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Andrew. Yes, I'm really looking forward to our next sessions. It was really a wonder wonderful um, morning. I'd like to introduce our first speaker. This is Adam Schiffenbauer. Adam is an associate research physician at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. He trained at uh, George Washington and then went on to NIH to do his fellowship in adult rheumatology. Uh, he remained there on faculty. His interests are really in understanding pathogenesis of calcinosis and also the treatment as well as other risk factors for the development of myositis. And today he's gonna to talk about calcinosis in juvenile myositis, its treatment and use of sodium thiol sulfate in its management. Go ahead, Adam. Thank you so much for the introduction and, and thank you to everybody for having me here to talk about this. 
Uh, and I'll try and keep us on time for my part. Um, next slide. These are my disclosures. Next slide. Uh, so calcinosis is heterotopic or dystrophic ossification of soft tissues. It's not true bone, and that's important for the differential if you get biopsy and see differences there. And it, although we're going to talk about it in the setting of JDM and DM here predominantly, um, it's found in lots of other autoimmune diseases like scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, um, and then non-autoimmune diseases. There are a fair amount of genetic syndromes and metabolic syndromes that also uh, lead to calcinosis. It's been associated with worse physical function in uh, the populations that we care about for myositis. Um, and the prevalence has had a pretty wide range of 10 to 70 percent. Um, and it's important to note that even though we talk about it as calcinosis and calcium is involved, there are other minerals involved as well, such as phosphorus, sodium, and magnesium um, that are part of its structure when we go through looking at it. Next slide. Um, so this is the, we don't know a lot, so I'm going to tell you things based off of not a lot of evidence here for many of the treatment and sort of evaluations that we do. There are no standardized criteria for evaluation of calcinosis. Um, if you look at papers that look at treatments um, or evaluations for calcinosis, the majority of them are uh, the patient or the physician says, we think they got better. Um, there are some better studies that use x-ray to sort of quantitate things, but there are no agreed upon general outcome measures for calcinosis improvement. There are no FDA approved medications for the treatment of calcinosis. Um, and sort of all the evidence is based off of case reports, case series, um, and now actually a couple of smaller nice studies um, as well that have happened. They say there's no standardized treatment. No standardized treatment, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. Um, so the assessment of calcinosis really has a couple of different parts, the physical exam uh, and imaging, which I'll talk about here for a little bit. The laboratory evaluation is, is not um, a huge part of the calcinosis evaluation. The calcium levels are usually normal. Um, sometimes genetic testing and phosphorus levels can be helpful, particularly if the calcinosis is unusual or there's something that leads you to think that maybe it's coming from a source other than the, auto, the autoimmune disorder. Um, and then looking at the laboratory markers that we normally look at for disease activity um, is important for understanding what's going on with the disease overall in the patient. Again, no patient reported outcomes. Uh, the Modsley is a tool now that's been used uh, for calcinosis in scleroderma patients. Um, and I, that's really overall the first calcinosis specific uh, patient reported outcome that we have. But uh, in scleroderma patients, we have some differences in how their calcinosis appears in X than uh, the juvenile myositis patients. Next slide. So in the physical exam, uh, some of the things we look at are the number of lesions and the size of the calcinosis lesions, how firm they are. So these can range from feeling very hard uh, to sort of a wooden or tree-like feel to them, um, to being liquid and very fluctuant sort of water balloon type uh, lesions when you feel them. Um, and then the location of the lesions, which ends up being very important in understanding uh, the, the sort of the functional impacts of the calcinosis. So these two patients, um, the one with the calcinosis on their finger has a much smaller lesion than that one um, on the leg that's quite large, but the functional impact for that large lesion on the leg was really very minimal. It didn't cross the joint, didn't impact function, whereas that uh, one small calcinosis on, calcinosis on the finger was quite debilitating. The person was unable to type, they were unable to hold a pen well, um, so they couldn't write or do their job um, or really communicate with a lot of people. So that location can be very important in sort of the functional impact. Um, and then ulceration, there can be skin breakdown over these areas of calcinosis and that's quite common. Next slide. Um, we talk about sort of calcinosis activity, um, looking at the warmth, tenderness and swelling associated with them. Uh, in an active calcinosis, this can very much look like an infection. Um, so it can look uh, very similar to a cellulitis or superficial skin infection or even a deeper skin infection in the areas where the calcinosis is. And it's important to differentiate because the treatments are very different, antibiotics versus anti-inflammatory medications. Um, and we see a fair number of patients who are treated as if these are infections recurrently. Um, and when you really talk to them, it turns out to be that really it's probably their calcinosis activity, um, not necessarily recurrent infection in those areas. Um, certainly there's damage that, and skin changes that can be associated with these contractures um, and then localized lipoatrophy. 
lipodystrophy has been associated with calcinosis um, and different time courses for which one is the risk factor for the other, but they certainly are very correlated with each other. Um, and then drainage. And the calcinosis can produce a wide range of different fluids that can come out of it. Some patients will describe it as pus-like or milk. It can look like water. Some will describe pebbles. Uh, we've had several patients who say it feels like teeth are coming out of those areas in their body. Um, but a wide range of sort of this production and expression of calcinosis. Next slide. Um, there's been different terminology over time for calcinosis, um, deep linear, calcareal, tumoral, um, superficial, and a lot of them at their basis sort of divide calcinosis along two categories. One is the shape, whether it's sort of a linear shape um, that usually follows some sort of fascial plane um, or it's sort of a bulky mass, um, that tumoral or calcareal shape. And then there's this lacy reticular pattern um, that's been described as well. Um, and it's been associated with uh, worse outcomes, harder to treat calcinosis. Um, so, you know, for this, we normally refer to the, the deep linear, deep calcareal, and then the superficial calcareal or superficial uh, planes. Um, exoskeleton is probably the most severe complication of calcinosis, and that's where there's complete encirclement of an area. And often we think about this as not just one localized area, but really for a majority of the, the person's body habit is to have this calcinosis that encircles them. Next slide. Um, so lots of different imaging modalities have been used. X-ray is by far the most common, and we'll get to seeing some evidence for that. Um, it has a lot of advantages. It's easy to get most of the time. You can see calcinosis pre pretty well on it. Um, you can do some measurements on it to track, calc track calcinosis size over time. Um, the drawbacks are, in our, particularly in our pediatric patients, there's radiation exposure, and it doesn't give you that 3D structure that may be helpful in some cases for understanding the calcinosis uh, more in depth and how it relates to other structures. Um, it won't tell you if there's a nerve or something entrapped in there necessarily or a blood vessel. Uh, scintigraphy um, has been used, it's not used very commonly. It does give you a nice full body image of where calcinosis is, um, and it does give you some information about activity. Um, again, it's not giving you a lot of that sort of structural, structural information, probably less than uh, the x-ray images do. Uh, there's a CT scan uh, has also been used. There was a, a recent paper that was very good from Dr. Pachman about this, um, looking at CT scan in the extremities. Uh, certainly in the pediatric population, it's the radiation exposure that we worry about. Um, and she was able to show you can get that radiation exposure in the extremities quite low. Um, this gives you something that's quantifiable that you can measure over time, um, and it does give you that 3D structure. So if this is somebody who's considering surgery or a mechanical intervention, it can really tell you a fair amount more um, about what you're likely to encounter. And we talk to a fair number of patients um, who go for surgery for calcinosis, and the story sort of is they show up, they go for surgery, the surgeon opens them up, looks inside and says, I can't do anything about that, um, and just closes them back up. Um, and CT scan may help in some of that planning. Um, MRI has the big advantage that it doesn't have any radiation, and that's why we like it for so many things in myositis. Um, the disadvantage here is it's hard to see calcinosis. So you can see in this image in the middle, um, that's about as good as calcinosis gets to see. It's those big sort of voids that are pointed to with the arrow. Um, but particularly if those are in the fat or the fascia, they can be difficult to see. Um, and even on the stir images, if they have fluid in them and they're in the fat, they can sort of blend into the fat area. Um, and they often can get missed unless the radiologist is told to really look for them. Um, it does show you edema and inflammation associated with the calcinosis. And it can catch low density calcinosis. So areas where there is more fluid and less actual calcium, which may get missed by CT or X-ray, will show up on the MRI because of that stir signaling that brings out the water and fluid there. Um, and then sort of not the last modality it's used, but the last, I think, common one is ultrasound. Um, it has the advantage it can be done at the bedside. It's quite easy to use. Um, no radiation again, which is nice. It can give you some of that 3D structure um, as you move the probe around. Um, we see that there's a lot of echoing and shadowing, so it makes it harder to see deep lesions, um, sometimes hard to follow their contours, uh, but it will let you look to see at least if there's calcinosis in those areas, particularly if it's superficial. It's not going to show you this calcinosis like you're seeing on the MRI that's deep and sort of embedded in the muscle. Uh, next slide. 
Um, so there was a great uh, study by CARA that surveyed uh, 103 physicians uh, about a whole bunch of areas about calcinosis uh, in juvenile myositis. And they said 60% use only history and physical to screen for calcinosis. So that's certainly the most common uh, activity that people are doing. And then out of those negative, only 28% go on to do imaging for calcinosis. Um, so it shows you sort of that limited imaging area that's used. And as I said, x-ray is by far the most common uh, imaging modality used, um, both for initial imaging and for monitoring for response uh, with ultrasound, MRI, and CT bringing up the rear. Um, with some of this low dose CT uh, data, we may see that move up this, this list some. Um, although 70% use imaging to assess for treatment response. Um, so it does have more of a, a effect there in following. And then 45% send calcium and vitamin D levels. And that's pretty, pretty reasonable for these patients. Although we do that for a lot of our uh, JDM and DM patients as well, just due to their underlying disease and uh, sun avoidant. Next slide. Um, so the treatments really fall under three categories, treatment targeting the underlying disease. So these are our anti-inflammatory medications, medications targeting the calcium and the calcinosis itself, um, and then the mechanical measures like surgery. Next slide. Um, so the prevention of calcinosis, there have been uh, several studies looking at um, different combinations of therapy and looking at how calcinosis um, shows up in those groups and what the response is. Um, IV steroids early has been shown to be helpful, but the total IV steroid dose doesn't seem to be that big a difference. And across a lot of them, the, the ongoing answer seems to be early aggressive therapy is helpful. Um, and I think that's sort of what we're seeing. And that's what we know about some of the risk factors for calcinosis is that active disease, particularly chronic active disease is a risk factor for calcinosis. So it makes sense that uh, treating the underlying juvenile dermatomyositis early um, will lead to less calcinosis in the population. And then it's good to see that some of these patients who develop calcinosis do have improvement when their therapy gets titrated up. Um, so the addition of cyclosporin and IVIG leading to a reduction in calcinosis um, and some of them resolving completely, I think is promising for our patients that there are ways to treat this better. And these are treating really just the underlying inflammation that's happening there. Next slide. Um, so IVIG has case reports of efficacy, but also case reports of lack of efficacy. Um, there's a nice retrospective study, study of eight patients um, where five of eight had a response. Um, the big thing here is those patients who responded to IVIG responded in terms of their entire disease. This wasn't something that just made the calcinosis better. It, it helped treat their JDM and DM overall and the calcinosis along with all the other markers of activity also improved. Um, a bad sept has been used in a, a case series uh, and there are reports of success. Um, one with the resolution of an ulcer, which is a nice outcome to see as well as resolutions of contractures. Uh, next slide. Uh, thalidomide, there's not been a lot published, but our, I know our European colleagues are using this a fair amount now and having good effect. I'm um, hoping we'll see more uh, in the literature about it, but it certainly has become, I think, more common uh, to be used there. And, and we are hearing reports of good efficacy um, in treating calcinosis. Uh, infliximab has been shown to have improvement in lesions. Um, Again, there have been a couple of retrospective studies, studies that have shown improvements in calcinosis uh, when treated with infliximab. Um, so I think there, there's benefits here, but these are patients also who are benefiting, again, their entire myositis disease. It's not targeted where just the calcinosis is responding. Uh, culture seems used pretty commonly. There are case reports of success, and we certainly hear lots of cases of improvement. There's one case of anakinra being used for improvement in calcinosis. Next slide. Um, and then these are medications that target the calcium, the calcinosis itself. Um, so the bisphosphonates are by far the most common one that people use, uh, followed probably by the calcium channel blockers. Um, there are lots of reports of success and failure and the, the cases of success are pretty um, strong evidence for it. They're, they match up in time, patients get a bisphosphonate, they immediately sort of have a benefit, it wears off. And then on rechallenge with the bisphosphonate, they again have improvement in their calcinosis um, and there's a nice repetitive pattern with withdrawal and re-administration. Um, there's been better evidence for pomidronate and elandronate, um, but my fine endocrine colleagues really think etigernate's the best one here um, based on mechanistic analysis and are, are strong advocates of it. Um, 
although comidronate and aladrate are certainly the ones we see the most benefits in. Um, sodium thiosulfate is a newer medication for calcinosis. I'm going to talk about it a lot more uh, further in, but it's used uh, IV topically and intralesionally, um, and there are different reasons to go about sort of each of those approaches. Um, aluminum hydroxide has been used, and there have been reports of efficacy there, and it's thought to be a phosphorus-based mechanism that's improving uh, calcinosis in this setting. Next one. Uh, Probenicid, there are two case reports, and I think there may have actually just been another case report that came out, um, uh, has been shown to have improvement. The calcium channel blockers had very strong data when they first came out, and uh, newer studies have been less promising. Um, this is another therapy that's often used for treatment of calcinosis and seems to have improvement in a subset of the population. Uh, Diltiazam in the study seems to have a slightly bigger efficacy effect, um, but it's hard. And then troprostanol, which I'm hoping we'll hear more about in the future, um, was a very interesting medication. So it was used in a scleroderma uh, study for the treatment of pulmonary hypertension. Um, and as a side effect, they saw a 50% improvement in calcinosis by x-ray at six months. Um, and I know they're doing studies now looking at this um, in calcinosis. Um, it has, if in patients who don't have pulmonary hypertension, that becomes the side effect is, is treating the pulmonary, the non-existent pulmonary hypertension. Um, but I'm hoping we'll see good stories from this about its efficacy. I put Coumadin and Warfarin up here uh, just as a, a note um, that they were used in the past and really have been shown not to be very efficacious and they come with a fair amount of side effects. Um, so something to avoid, I think, in our patients these days. Next slide. Um, so this was a nice paper that looked at sort of different treatments in 16 patients with calcinosis. Um, and across the board, they showed that no medical treatment caused a reduction in calcinosis or prevention of new sites. Um, so their only response was subjective improvement by the patient, uh, which I think is important when you see a lot of these case series and case reports that really are objective improvement by the patient as sort of the outcome or the physician. Um, and then I think the other point here is that three out of six surgery patients relapsed, uh, one case with local infection, one case of sepsis. And I think it's, it's important to know, and, and many of us know this, that the surgery for calcinosis is not a cure-all. Um, that these patients often have relapse of the calcinosis, often in the same area, um, and usually very quickly when it happens. Um, so we try to avoid surgery, and you'll see some data from CARA that sort of reflects that opinion. Next slide. Um, going briefly through mechanical measures, um, there's good data that some of the calcinosis seems to be triggered by microtrauma. Um, so just general avoidance procedures of padding in places people hit recent, uh, repetitively, um, and trying to avoid those situations, surgical resection that we talked about. Uh, lithotripsy has been used. There's a, a nice Japanese group that has a study out um, and has been having good effect with lithotripsy. Uh, we get concerned about releasing cytokines and, and more inflammatory um, cascade with breaking up this calcinosis and the fluid associated with it. And there haven't been great long-term outcomes from lithotripsy. We haven't seen things about the, the relapse and reoccurrence over time there when it does. Um, and then people have tried carbon dioxide laser therapy and hyperbaric oxygen as well. Um, next slide. Um, so this is that another part of that great CARA survey. And you can see, as I said about surgery, that only 5% refer for surgery as first line therapy. Um, and 38% believe in using surgery only if medical therapy fails. Um, and again, sort of reserving that surgery uh, for cases that are failing medical therapy, where it's it, the location and the advancement is really endangering the patient. Um, so this means crossing a joint line where you're worried about the development of contractures or severely limiting their ability to work or function. Um, and then 67% say their first line choice is increasing the baseline immunosuppression. And that goes with that concept that uh, active myositis is a risk factor for calcinosis. So if you control the myositis better, you do a better job of preventing and treating the calcinosis. Um, the agents that were most popular were IVIG, systemic steroids, methotrexate, uh, mycophenolate mopatil, tacrolimus, coltracine, and cyclosporin. Um, and you can see that on the treatment for the drugs targeted at calcinosis, it's those bisphosphonates and calcium ch channel blockers uh, are way ahead of everything else um, in terms of what people use. Um, but the sodium thiosulfate, both the topical and the IV are, are getting up there. And those are probably more now um, than when this study first came out, they've become more popular. Next slide. Um, so I wanted to talk about sodium thiosulfate for a little bit here. Um, 
So it's currently approved uh, by the FDA for cyanide toxicity. Um, it's used a lot off label for extravasation of uh, chemotherapeutic agents. It binds chemo. So if the IV comes out and they get under the skin, the, the uh, chemo nurse will give sodium thiosulfate into that area to try and bind up the agent um, and prevent uh, damage. And there's a growing literature of case reports. Um, there's a nice study from GW using laser-driven topical sodium thiosulfate. Um, and it can be administered IV topically or intralesionally. So topical sodium thiosulfate has to get compounded um, and it's applied to the, the affected areas. And there have been good results from that. The intralesional is a local injection into an area of calcinosis um, compared to the topical, maybe a deeper lesion um, or something that's very targeted. Um, the main problem with the intralesional is it's incredibly painful for most patients. Um, there have been different techniques suggested about how to prevent uh, that severe pain, but in most cases, during the injections. It doesn't, it's not a long lasting pain at, at, during this period, but it's, it is very painful. Um, and then IV. So patients who have diffuse calcinosis or very deep calcinosis, um, you know, the, that calcinosis as you saw from the MRI that's sort of embedded in the muscle, IV therapy in order to try and manage that. Um, and the side effects for the IV therapy are nausea, metabolic acidosis, uh, fracture, hypertension, hypernitremia, um, our fine renal colleagues are very insistent that perhaps it causes kidney stones. Uh, and then osteopenia is a th theoretical risk, uh, just uh, its mechanism of action. Next slide. Uh, so sodium thiosulfate was first used for calcium uh, disorders. There was a chemist whose wife had calcinosis from a different disease and said there has to be something that binds calcium and makes it more soluble and all this will go away. And he did a lot of research and said, I'm going to give my wife this medication. And he gave it to her to try and treat it. Um, and that was the, the first use of uh, sodium thiosulfate for calcinosis. Um, so it's not a huge fancy pathway way like many of our JAK inhibitors today, binds the calcium, makes it more soluble. Um, it turns out it's a lot more complicated medication than that. So there's some work in the sepsis literature um, that shows it has pretty potent anti-inflammatory properties as well. Um, so it's an upstream inhibitor of NF-kappa B um, in a mouse model inhibits TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-8, IL-1B. Um, and then it alters endothelial function as well. Um, it produces nitric oxide production, um, and it also causes vasodilation, which is uh, a helpful benefit in some of these patients potentially. Uh, and then it serves as an antioxidant. Next slide. Um, so we have an ongoing study here at NIH. We're seeing uh, juvenile adult patients with dermatomyositis, uh, ages seven plus, uh, who have calcinosis that's moderate to severe, um, and then what we're labeling is extensive, so at least two limbs or the torso. Uh, they have to have stable myositis disease activity um, and stable medications, and then no prior use of sodium thiosulfate, which as time goes on, we're seeing uh, more and more use of sodium thiosulfate off-label for the calcinosis. Um, it, there are four one-week visits, and then there's one large 10-week visit where they get three times a week IV infusions. Um, no placebo group for the patients. Everyone gets therapy. There is a lead-in period. And you're all, you'll get the slides, but that's the information if you want to know more about our, our study as time goes on. Um, and this is one of our patients, one of our recent patients who's getting uh, sodium glass support now. This was up in her room. Uh, so we have a nice, nice views for some of our folks. Next slide. Um, so, in you know, our conclusions are calcinosis is an important complication of many diseases. Um, this isn't just a JDM or DM or myositis sort of problem, but it's across the board. Um, and this was reflected in the studies that are ongoing. There are big studies in calciphylaxis, secondary to end stage renal disease. Um, they're using uh, sodium thiosulfate now, as well as other protocols trying to treat this. Um, and then lots of consideration of similarities between calcinosis. Um, and vascular calcification and how those get managed appropriately. Uh, the physical exam and imaging studies are both important um, in identifying and monitoring the calcinosis. And I think you can see that from the CARA literature about how many people are using physical exam and imaging. Um, and then the optimal imaging differs based on the goal, the lesions, and the patient. So how, how concerned you are about radiation dose based on that patient, whether you just need to know whether calcinosis is there, whether you're planning for a surgery, um, X-ray or ultrasound may be good enough to know it's there if you're really planning for a surgery, um, it's in an abdomen or pelvis, um, somewhere where there's more tissue. A CT scan may be a lot more helpful in sort of your, your surgical management. There are no clear best treatment options. Um, I think overall people's initial treatment here is to aggressively treat the underlying myositis. Um, 
We see differences in management of, of calcinosis across different specialties, dermatology and rheumatology, um, juvenile rheumatologists and adult rheumatologists. Um, but a lot of this has to do with aggressive therapy early, um, it's sort of universal across all those groups. Um, we think sodium, th sodium thiosulfate um, may work through multiple mechanisms despite its initial use um, as this calcium chelating agent. Um, that it, it may work through other ways as well, particularly these anti-inflammatory and vascular pathways. Um, and then certainly there's, there's a need for more research as time goes on here, um, that we need outcome measures to really assess calcinosis um, well so that we can do better studies and more uniform studies across areas um, to move this research forward. Next slide. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge our group here at NIHS, Dr. Ryder, Dr. Miller, uh, Terry O'Hanlon, as well as the rest of our people, as well as NIAMS, who we work very closely with. Um, you've heard from some of them already today, um, but they're great colleagues that we have here, as well as uh, Cure JM and the Myositis Association, who have been very supportive of us over time uh, and helping us get patients and uh, advocate for our, the research in these areas. Thank you. Go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Um, it's Eric Hoffman. Eric uh, received his PhD from Johns Hopkins, uh, did a postdoctoral fellowship in pediatrics and genetics at Harvard, and presently is at Binghamton University, State University of New York, uh, in the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. He also is the co-founder of Revergen Biopharma, as well as a few other uh, companies. Um, and, and for his lifelong career, he's really tried to study neuromuscular disease, the genetics of the neuromuscular disease pathogenesis, and now try to improve the interventions that we have for the disease. So he's gonna talk about a safer st uh, steroidal anti-inflammatory structural to clinical studies of lung. Thanks so much. And thanks for rearranging this. this uh, ran into some flight issues. Uh, uh, at the last moment here. So I'll talk about a possible safe of steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, structure of clinical studies of amorolone. Uh, disclosures, uh, I am uh, at, wear a number of hats, including co-founder and CEO and board member of the uh, sponsor of this drug I'll talk about. Um, if we go over, if you just look at a sort of treatment paradigm from a recent review of Chet Otis, uh, you can see uh, the various treatments of myositis and if you just look, almost all of them uh, to date have involved uh, glucocorticoids. So why do corticosteroids or glucocorticoids work so well? They're very strong drugs, a sledgehammer on the immune system. They bind to the drug target, which is the glucocorticoid receptor or GR. And the GR plus drug binds to and activates a lot of your genes. So roughly it's been calculated 10% of your genes in your genome are turned on by glucocorticoids. And in this response, there's a strong suppression of uh, NF-kappa-B uh, immunity danger signals. So they're sort of magic and they're used extensively in all sorts of chronic inflammatory states, but there's a bit of a dark side to the magic and that's adverse events, effects. And so uh, I'm sure most or every, whoops, everybody on the audience is, is familiar with these side effects. Uh, particularly in children, there's also stunting of growth um, mood disturbances and delay of puberty. Uh, and in, for example, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is our current focus, um, they're treated you know, decades, 10 or, or more years, and these become major mor morbidities. So corticosteroids were the fastest Nobel Prize ever awarded. Uh, 10 patients were treated with arthritis. They got much better almost overnight. And then the next year, they, after that paper was published, they awarded the Nobel Prize for corticosteroids, but even there they said you have to do something about the side effects. Uh, so the question really is can the benefits of corticosteroids be separated from the side effects? So uh, to understand how vomorolone works, you need to understand that corticosteroids have really two distinct mechanisms of action. One is transactivation, which is positive reg gene regulatory activity. There's a dyad symmetry to the DNA binding site of the ligand receptor complex, and it turns on these genes. Um, it's target genes that have these GREs or group corticoid response genes. Increasingly, it's been recognized that the NF-kappa B inhibition is through a separate distinct activity, which is an inhibitory gene transcription activity. 
completely different sequence. And uh, uh, the receptor binds not in a dyad symmetry, but just one side of the receptor binds of the dimer, and it inhibits NF-kappa D transcription complexes. Now to understand how the next part, the key thing is increasingly transactivation has been associated with side effects and NF-kappa D is clearly efficacy. But further that the, these accessory proteins, so co-activators like PGC1 alpha are absolutely necessary for transactin, transactivation. So there's lots of co-activators um, but you need at least one of them to carry out transactivation. So it, it's a separate protein that sort of stabilizes and facilitates the uh, receptor DNA binding. In contrast, transrepression requires co-repressors, a completely distinct set of proteins like NCOR and others that again, stabilize this interaction. And if you do not have co-repressors binding, you do not have transrepression. So with what the Morlone does is really quite simple. It just, these are the uh, hydrogen bonding sites of the prednisolone, which is the active metabolite of prednisone, and vomorolone, it, it itself is the active drug, interacting with the glucocorticoid receptor. And you see almost, they're very similar in structure, and almost all the hydrogen bonds are, are the same except for one. So it has to do with this key, um, aspirogene 33, this is a different number in the intact receptor. Uh, and you, when you lose that bond because of the structure of a moral and you twist the drug a bit in the receptor. So what happens when you do that, here you see now a ribbon diagram, three-dimensional structure of the drugs in the receptor. And, the more, and what's read here is differential um, exposure of the receptor to, to, to water, so uh, solute accessibility. And the difference between prednisone and other corticosteroids and vomorolone is you push these domains out because you've lost that one hydrogen bond. These domains become more accessible to water, to, uh, to solute. And what these are the coactivator co-repressor binding domains. So in changing these co-activator, co-repressor binding domains, vomorolone ends up uh, binding less co-activators with threefold less affinity, whereas co-repressors are equal or more. So here you end up with a separation of activities because the co-activator uh, activity associated with side effects is now less and the co-repressor activity associated with anti-inflammatory activity is more. So you can look at that in vitro, and we did that early on. And here is an a, a in vitro assay of NF-kappa B inhibition. And you see that vomorolone, which is VBP15, is right in there along with prednisone. Whereas if you look at the uh, GREs or transactivation, then you see none of these vomorolone-like drugs in vomorolone itself induces GRE activity compared to prednisone and the other corticosteroids. And I should mention that all corticosteroids share the same structure of prednisone and prednisolone, which is not shared with vomorolone. So vomorolone is a first-in-class drug. It's not a corticosteroid. So we went to Duchenne muscular dystrophy has been our first indication. We went straight to pediatrics. Um, and so the first trial was 48 boys, four to seven years that were steroid naive. Our primary outcome was time to stand velocity. And so here you just see uh, a broad dose range of a morlone, a 24-fold dose range from 0 0.25, 0 0.75, 2, and 6 mg per kg. This is a, a natural history study, um, steroid naive. And you see that significant improvements relative to steroid naive and a dose responsive. So there are about 11 or 12 kids per group. Uh, other outcomes were similar. Clear dose response significance versus natural history studies. This is time to run walk. And lastly, six minute walk test, very clear dose response, low dose, next dose, next dose, next dose, and the highest dose. I should mention this highest dose is about 10 times uh, greater than prednisone, typical prednisone dose. So in Duchenne, prednisone is given at about 0.75 mg per kg per day, whereas this highest dose is six mg per kg per day. 
Um, now I'll just show 18 months treatment of DMD with lamorelone. This was just recently published, uh, 18 month, and these are open label studies. Um, but the kids continue to improve over a year and a half. So you see um, significant improvements of all outcome measures, uh, generally about a P of 0.001. It's interesting, and I'll talk about this next, time to stand velocity while it's a primary outcome, and it's the first milestone that's lost in Duchenne muscular dystrophy and, and um, in kids with uh, many neuromuscular disorders. That's the sort of the hardest test to do, stand up unaided from the floor because proximal weakness, that's challenging. Um, the, what I'll show you is that kids on corticosteroids have so much stunting of growth, whereas kids with lamorelone have no stunting of growth, and so the time to stand starts taking on a different character uh, in these tests. So here, just comparing um, dose ranging, and I put uh, how much improvement there is to baseline. Duchenne is a bit variable disease, but here are your different dose groups, and against the natural history studies, uh, those are corticosteroid naive. Then when we go to corticosteroid treated natural history studies, we see roughly on par uh, improvements. And we didn't have a baseline for the natural history, but here's the baseline for these kids um, you know, on Lamorelone for a year and a half. So again, to say that these are open label studies, not double blind placebo controlled, but to just conclude, we did a broad dose ranging, FSC outcomes dose responsive over six months, continued clinical improvement of all outcomes over a year and a half. Seems efficacy similar to corticosteroids, but we have not yet done head to head. And what of safety and side effects? So here's the um, emphlaza or deflaza court is approved for Duchenne muscular dystrophy relatively recently. Um, and this is the registration trial data that I'm showing here for emphlaza. The registration trial was done about 15 years ago, but then it was um, um, brought up to FDA and used for drug approval. But you see here this uh, uh, least squares mean change in heights percentiles for age. And when on high dose corticosteroids, kids just fall off the growth charts. So that's stunting of growth. And you see by 95% confidence interval, basically all kids are showing stunting of growth. If we look at vomorolone kids treated a year and a half with high dose vomorolone, they, all of the kids are growing. Now, kids with Duchenne are actually short for age, probably because of bone muscle interaction, but so they're actually speeding up a bit their growth uh, relative to their own baseline. So all kids are growing, whereas all kids are showing growth stunting. And if you just, even though these aren't head to head, you can just run a p-value and that's 10 to the minus eight. We also have comparisons of physician reported safety concerns. And again, this is the registration trial that was done 15 years ago with the approved dose of the Flaser Court. And again, we're higher here, the highest dose of Lamorlone. Um, and what we see is much less report of Krishnoid, uh, less report of weight gain, less report of hirsutism, and less report of behavior change. So, uh, in conclusion, in summary then, I, I should mention that we now have about 160 kids on Vomorlone long-term, 48 from the first studies, and we're now enroll, have completed enrollment in 121 uh, a child double-blind registration study. That has both a placebo and a prednisone comparator, and that readout should be uh, our early next year. Of the kids coming off all trials, 95% of families and physicians have opted to remain on Vomorlone rather than transition to cortico standard of care at end of trials. And to date, again, we're unusual in going straight to PEDS, but we have about 150 year, uh, patient years of safety data in children. So Vomorlone seems to show less safety concerns and structure activity relationships consistent with clinical findings. So just to end, cure JM questions, uh, would vomorolone have potential efficacy in juvenile my myositis and other chronic inflammatory diseases? And we think, yes, there's uh, lots of, we've done now lots of published preclinical mouse models in asthma, multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease, gliomas, arthritis, and vomorolone works as well or better than uh, corticosteroids in each of those mouse models. Assuming approval for Duchenne from the FDA, what is the anticipated time period for approval, and we're looking at uh, quarter four 2021 or quarter one 2022 um, by the time we get the NDAN. So what on what need would Vomorlone potentially fulfill in JDM? Well, JDM, like many chronic inflammatory states, is remitting a relapsing disease. 
Corticosteroids are often used to induce remission. Biologics may induce remission, but then typically involve chronic, possibly lifelong treatment. Generally, biologics, uh, you do not treat uh, um, relapses uh, cro chronically um, because of the, when you take off biologics that's the, and reintroduce them, possibility of antibodies. Long-term treatment with biologics in children leads to repeat injections. Most biologics are injectables, long-term commitment, and high cost. So the possible role of a Moreland JDM is to replace corticosteroids, treat flares with fewer safety concerns, and possible option for children with refractory disease or intolerance for other treatments. So the proposed plan for Bemorolone, we've been working with CureJM and um, investigators in JDM for some years now. We had a NIH grant to do established pharmacodynamic biomarkers, and that was published by Conklin and Val about two years ago. The next steps are to submit, submit a pre-IND to FDA with permission to continue to a JDM clinical trial. And we're working collaboratively with uh, you guys um, and hope to submit that in December 2020. Um, it should be pre-IND, not pre-NDA. Um, and then get feedback from the FDA, and if go ahead, then seek funding for a full-fledged um, pilot trial uh, to show proof of principle. And that's the last slide. I'd just like to thank all the nonprofit foundations and governments that have supported this program to date, particularly um, NCATS for their, we were an early awardee of the Therapeutics for Rare and Neglected Disease, and they really de-risked us extensively. NINDS and the European Com Commission has funded the clinical trials to date. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. Um, I just I want to start with a question about um, the whole adrenal access, and and I know you showed in the work with muscular dystrophy around growth and other aspects. Do you have biological evidence too that it's is less um, toxic to to that part of the body? It's certainly less in terms of adrenal suppression. Um, but we're also at higher doses. So it's, it's what our therapeutic is in terms of adrenal suppression is being defined in the current uh, blinded trial because there we're doing ACDH challenge or a synactin test, both pre and post drug and even after the more, over a whole year in these kids. And we're doing benchmarking against prednisone as well and placebo. So the data to date suggests when we get, uh, we did phase one studies to very high doses. So we went up to 20 mix per pig per day. So that's you know, over 15, 20 fold over what prednisone typically, or more like 30 fold over what prednisone is typically done. And um, there we started seeing um, loss of more diurnal rhythm. So there was some uh, suppression of the adrenal axis. Um, in the ch childhood studies, we really can't address that because the first and morning were not really first and morning because you can't really fast and get blood samples in a child right at awakening easily. So that's not, the ACTH will be a much better test of that. Thanks. There was another question in the chat about how does Vomorolone compare to the HDAC uh, stat that's in the DMD pill? Um, that's hard to say. So both of those are in phase three, both of them are alone and the genvinostat are in phase three trials currently. Um, so neither has read out as far as I know. The, the mechanism of action is completely different. So genvinostat is an HDAC that's supposed to um, change epigenomics and encourage regeneration. Uh, whereas Vomorolone is has three activities, anti-inflammatory like prednisone, but also is a mineral corticoid antagonist, which is the opposite of prednisone, which is an agonist. And it's also a membrane stabilizer um, and should inc increase dystrophin levels even in JDM kids because chronic inflammatory states in muscle reduce dystrophin levels through a microRNA pathway and Vomorolone inhibits those inflammatory related uh, microRNAs. So we should restore some dystrophin expression in uh, JDM kids. So there's another comment or question around all of your patient years experience. What are the side effects that you've seen? Not much. Um, to date, it's about 10% about of kids show weight gain. Um, there's out of the 160 kids, I think there's one, two or three that were either reduced the dose, a couple that reduced dose, uh, at the highest dose. So we've allowed the physicians and families and these long-term extension studies to choose the dose. Uh, 
And so generally they're going between six, which is the highest, and two mg per kg. And both of those are three and 10 times higher than prednisone. Um, but it, as you saw by the physician report, it still seems less than with prednisone. Um, but that I think is all we've seen. Oh, we've seen one case of um, where kid had uh, liver enzymes elevated and it seemed to be uh, hepatitis. And it seemed like vomorolone might have been exacerbating that or interacting with that because if we took away vomorolone, the liver enzymes went down and reintroduced it, they went up again. That's known with corticosteroids as well, um, but it was only one kid so far out of 116. One last question, and I'll let you go catch your plane. Um, would the mineralocorticoid antagonism of vomorolone be expected to help decrease long-term cardiovascular disease risk in JDM? That's what we think, and there's certainly preclinical evidence of that. And just to, that's a really important question and to bring the audience engaged in that. So the, the steroid hormones and the steroid um, receptors can show some cross-reaction. Like, um, I mean, there's a, a bunch of examples in clinical uh, use. Uh, prednisone is an agonist of the mineral corticoid receptors, so it uh, causes water retention and it impacts the aldosterone axis. So that may, may contribute to cushionoid. Um, Vomorolone, because of its loss of that one hydrogen bond, probably does the same thing to mineral corticoid receptor and has reversed the activity. So it's a potent antagonist, and it's very similar in activity and potency to a plerinone and spironolactone. And so those are uh, cardiovascular drugs, particularly for uh, late-stage cardiac um, uh, cardiomyopathy or cardiac failure. And they're used in Duchenne late stage, the uh, mineral corticoid antagonist. So we do think that we should have a beneficial impact. And again, in pre published preclinical studies, that's clearly the case where we can um, have a, a good effect on heart um, outcomes. Uh, we haven't done heart studies in the Duchenne trials today because they're so young and we don't usually see heart involvement until a decade later. But we are planning to call some of those kids back a decade later after treatment to see if we've prevented perhaps cardiac disease. Thank you very much. Appreciate you taking the time. Um, and so um, thanks, Dr. Hoffman. Thank you. I want to be able to move on to our next speaker, and I want to thank him, Dr. Curiel, for letting us switch. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, Dr. Rodolfo Curiel is a um, medical faculty associate at uh, George Washington University. He's an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Rheumatology. Did his training at the University of Buenos Aires. Um, and came to GW and NIH for um, research training and additional um, training. He presently is the director of the GW, or the George Washington uh, Myositis Center, and is very involved with education of uh, rheumatologists, our future providers. His talk today is about abatacep in refractory juvenile myositis. Okay, thank you for, are you, I'm okay with the volume? Yes, thank you. Okay. So thank you, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'm an, an adult uh, rheumatologist, and yet in our uh, myositis centers, we see mostly patients with juvenile myositis. I mean, I would say that 65% of the patients are juvenile myositis, and 35% of the patients are adult myositis. I work very closely with two pediatric rheumatologists. One is my mentor, Dr. Lisa Ryder. She introduced me to myositis and Dr. O.J. Jones. And uh, I mean, I would say that I, I am a adult rheumatologist by training, but I'm becoming a pediatric rheumatologist at heart. And, and, and I'm becoming really, really interested in pediatric rheumatology. So ne ne next time. Next slide. So in our center, just a brief summary, uh, the center opened in 2008, and we have seen more than 500 patients with juvenile myositis, mostly from you know, all over the US and some patients internationally. And some of you have referred patients to us, and we are uh, very grateful. So next slide. So. We are now conducting a clinical trial uh, using abatacep, and I'm going to give you a little bit of history as to why we became very interested in abatacep for JDM. So this is the case. It's a 
patient that we saw several a few years ago. She's a 14 years old Caucasian girl. She came to us with a very severe refractory juvenile dermatomyositis with a lot of calcinosis, cutaneous ulcers, very weak. And, and as you can see from the table uh, at baseline, her CMAS uh, was 35, the MMP8 was 70, and he had a check of 0.75 we decided to treat the patient with cytoxin, IV cytoxin with steroids, oral and IV. She also received IV, IG and tacolimus. She got that treatment for almost, for six months. And as you can see, after six months, there was no improvement. Actually, she was getting worse. Her uh, CMAS dropped to 25. She became weaker and her check uh, went higher to 1.75, 175. So we decided to treat that patient with abatacept, IV, and, and sodium thiosulfate, and we did that for six months. And as you can see, her CMAS improved significantly. The baseline was 35, and she went up to 45. The muscle strength also improved significantly from 70 baseline to 77, and the chuck, I mean, the patient was feeling better, and the chuck went from 175 after six months of cytoxin and dropped to 0.50 after six months of abatacid. Next slide, and what was very impressive is how her uh, cutaneous ulcerations improved. Uh, on the left, in picture A, this is the patient uh, after treatment with cytoxan, IV steroids, IV IG, and tacolimus. And on B, uh, on the right, this is the patient after six months treatment uh, of uh, abatacin and thiosulfate IV. And so this is why we decided to explore uh, abatacin further with uh, uh, performing a, a clinical trial. So next slide. So what, what is uh, abatacept? Well, abatacept is a, or abatacia is a fusion protein consistent of the extracellular domain of CTLA-4 linked to the FC portion of the human IgG. And so how does it work? So the extracellular portion of CTLA-4 and abatacept binds to CD86, which is a co-stimulatory molecule on the antigen presenting cells. And that binding prevents the interaction between CD86 on the antigen presenting cells and CD28 on the uh, T cells. And the end result is suppression of the activation and proliferation of the T cells. So next, next slide, as you, of course, you know, probably from uh, basic immunology, the activation, you know, in order to have a full activation of the T cells, two signals are required. The signal one comes from the interaction between the MHC class one or class two molecules and uh, the receptor on the T cells. And the signal uh, number one comes from the interaction between the CD80 co-stimulatory molecule on the dendritic cells with the CD28 co-stimulatory molecule on the T cell receptor. And again, abatacept, abatacept uh, suppresses or inhibits that interaction and again, and prevents a full activation of the T cells. So how do we know that, I mean, CTLA-4 is involved in probably the pathogenesis of myositis. I mean, definitely the information is very limited, but it, uh, we know that the CTLA-4 is not only, you know, from previous research, that the CTLA-4 is not only expressed on B cells and the dendritic cells, but also in muscle fibers of patients with myositis. Other research, have, other studies have demonstrated that CTLA-4 and CD28 may protect muscle from apoptosis and it may contribute to the repair of damaged uh, muscle. And this is 
sort of the basic information or the basic research, the information that we have about the CTLA-4, the clinical experience with CTLA-4 is very limited. There are some case reports. And, and next slide, there are a few clinical trials that uh, have been per performed using Abatacept. One international randomized trial is going on right now. I think the, the enrollment has been completed and the trial has been analyzed for results. And the previous trial that was already published is the one that was in, done in Sweden. Probably you are uh, familiar with this trial. They studied uh, adult dermatomyositis and polymyositis. This was a randomized trial in uh, phase 2b treatment de delayed star trial and basically the patients the eligible patients were randomized to either arm a where the patients received abatacid from week zero uh, for six months and then the arm b where the patients received abatacid after three months so for three months there were no treatment and after three months they received uh, about the set. And of course, the assessors were blinded to the treatment plan. 20 patients were enrolled in this trial and 17 patients were analyzed. Next, try, uh, next slide. Next slide, please. And uh, patients, uh, patient, inclusion criteria, patients with active disease despite the treatment with glucocorticoids, uh, at least point, uh, 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day for one month in combination with at least another immune suppressive medication such as metotrexate 15 milligrams weekly or azotiaprine 100 milligrams for at least three months without enrolled and uh, concomitant metotrexate uh, concomitant use of metotrexate and azotiaprine was allowed but patient had to be stable at least uh, with that dose for with those medication for at least uh, one month. Next slide. Uh, this is how active disease was defined in, our, in that trial. Uh, so the MMT8, bilateral MMT8 has to be 150. Patient has to have low endurance and plus one of the following, either an elevated muscle enzymes above the upper limit or an MRI showing evidence of inflammation within the prior the, within the prior months, a muscle biopsy showing again uh, inflammation, and uh, again the biopsy done within the month one month of enrollment, or extramuscular uh, active extramuscular disease. Uh, next slide. The primary endpoint of this trial was the number of responders uh, based on the definition, the IMAX definition of improvement after six months of treatment. Uh, you are all familiar with the definition of improvement. Uh, it is required that the patient improves at least 20% in three of any six corset measures and with no more than two corset measures worsening by 25%. You have, of course, listed here the course of measures, physician global activity, patient global activity, the manual muscle strength, the uh, health assessment questionnaire, muscle enzymes, and extramuscular activity. So that was the primary endpoint. And secondary endpoint was the number of responders in delayed onset treatment compared to the active treatment and, at three and six months changes in individual components of the corset measures and the degree of inflammation and the degree of inflammation on repeated muscle biopsy after six months. Next slide. This is a little bit the design of the trial. Uh, again, 20 patients enrolled, 11 with polymyositis and nine with dermatomyositis, of course, with active disease despite the treatment with steroid and another immune suppressive medicine. Patients were randomized either to delay start treatment. So patients started the treatment after three months and or uh, at the beginning. And uh, patients all received intravenous infusions of abatacept 
at a dose of the 10 milligrams per kilogram for six months. And they received seven total doses, seven doses at week zero, two, four, eight, 12, 16. Patients were randomized. Uh, they receive IV uh, abatacept, 10 milligrams per kilogram for six months. And uh, seven doses at week zero, two, four, eight, 12, 16, and 20 weeks. So the next slide, even though I don't see it, but I, I can see it in my computer. This is the basic, basic baseline characteristic of the two groups. And uh, as you can see, I mean, they were very similar. Uh, group A, 73% were, were females and uh, roughly 50% of the patients have dermatomyositis, 90% were Caucasians and almost 100% on group A were on glucocorticoids and 78% on group B were on glucocorticoids. Roughly 50% of the patients were on methotrexate, not many on azotiaprim, just 25% of the patients on RB. Uh, up to 50% of the patients had history of uh, interstitial lung disease. And as you can see, patients have mildly to moderately active uh, disease. Uh, so the next slide. Uh, so clinical benefit was suggested from this trial. And as you can see, uh, five out of 10 patients were responders in the active treatment uh, versus one out of seven, 14% were responders in the delayed onset treatment at three months. Of course, there was no uh, significant difference, but the, the number of patients is not uh, significant. Uh, they found a significant improvement in the corset measures at months three and six in uh, comparing arm, uh, arm A, which is the active treatment versus arm B, the delayed treatment. And improvements were seen in patient global activity, the muscle strength, the CK, and the extramuscular activity. And A patients achieve what is the primary end goal of the trial, the definition of improvement, and muscle strength or muscle performance after six months of treatment in both groups was significantly improved. As you can see, the MMT8 went from 70 to 73, which a p-value of 0.008. Also the functional index improved and the muscle disease activity based on the visual analog, analog scale. So the next, uh, the next slide, when patients were analyzed based on the ACR ULAR response criteria, as you can see uh, from the table, Compare, comparing arm A, which is the early treatment versus arm B, patients with received late treatment at three months, the uh, total improvement score was 28.8 in arm A versus five in arm B, which is, uh, reached a statistical significance 0 0.03. And when the patients were divided based on the degree of the improvement, Minimal improvement at three months was seen in 60% of the patients on arm A versus 20% of the patients on arm B, the ones that did not get early treatment. And at six months, 80% of the patients on arm A uh, improved, have at least a minimal improvement versus 40% of the patients on arm B. Uh, same thing with moderate improvement at three months, 40% of the patients on arm A reach uh, improvement and versus 10% of the patients on arm, B, on arm B. And no measure improvement was seen in any of the groups. And six patients had a repeat biopsy after six months. And as you can see that one of the most significant results was increase on the Fox P3 expression I mean, uh, as you know, it's uh, one of the transcription factors uh, controlling the activity of regulatory T cells. So again, some benefit was suggested from this trial. And so in, in, in this here, here, if you go to the next slide, uh, 
This is the side effects. 36 adverse events were reported in that trial, most of them uh, infections. And uh, three patients had a serious adverse event that, uh, based on the authors, were unrelated to the study drug. One patient was hospitalized due to a fracture. One, another patient had worsening muscle weakness, and another patient uh, worsening of the previous pre-existing uh, basal cell cancer. So the next slide. So we are again uh, conducting a, a trial, a trial in our center, the Avatasset for the treatment of refractory juvenile dermatomyositis. This is an open label, non-randomized trial. Uh, we are planning to enroll 10 patients with refractory JDM, again, to assess safety and efficacy of abatacept. Uh, the study consists of a screening visit and five protocol visits over six months. And the patients uh, are seen every six weeks. And uh, patients receive weekly uh, abatacept. Uh, based on body weight. For patients who are weigh more than 50 kilograms, they get 125 milligrams of sub-Q abatacept. And for patients with weight that the weight is less than 50 kilograms, they receive 87.5 milligrams sub-Q weekly. Uh, at week 12, if patients did not improve or if they got worse, the, we uh, increase uh, the dose based on protocol. And there is an open label extension of six months that is offered to all the patients participating in the trial. The next slide, here are the inclusion criteria. Uh, we enroll patients, uh, pediatric patients, seven years of age or older with a definite or probably diagnosis of JDM, at least body weight, at least 25 kilograms. Patients uh, have to have refractory JDM and we define refractory as intolerance or in a, inadequate response to steroid for at least one month, plus another immune suppressive medicine for three months. Patients enroll, they have to have moderately, at least moderately active JDM. And we define that as a MD global of 2.5, at least 2.5 or higher, plus another two other abnormal corset measures listed here, the MMT8, no greater than 125, the parent patient global activity uh, two or higher, a CHAC uh, equal or more than 0.25, elevated muscle enzymes, and global extramuscular activity at least two on a scale from one to 10. And uh, patients have to be on stable medications, Prednisone, the recommended dose is one milligram per kilogram, but not all the patients are on that dose. Uh, and the dose of the prednisone, the IVSG or methylprednisolone, if they are on IV steroid, have to be stable for at least four weeks. And other immune suppressive medicines, such as azotiaprim, methotrexate, mycophenolate, leflunomide, cyclophosphamide, tacolimus or cyclosporine, have to be stable for at least six weeks. If patients were on other medicines, mostly rituximab, that is a washout period for rituximab, three months plus detectable CD19 cells. For other, for prednisone, if the prednisone has been discontinued, the washout period is at least for four weeks. And for IVIG, another immune suppressive medication is at least eight weeks. Next slide. And the primary, of course, endpoint is a definition of, of improvement based on the, the, the IMAX definition of improvement. Again, uh, three of any six corset measures improved by 20%, with no more than two of the corset measures worsening by 25. And the secondary uh, endpoints is uh, the steroid sparing effect response to uh, in individual corset measures, patient reported outcomes, cutaneous activity, muscle inflammation detected by MRI, uh, 
damage, disease damage, and improvement in uh, biomarkers. And so far, I mean, we're almost finishing the trial. Nine, patient, nine patients have been enrolled. Eight patients completed the trial and one patient is in ongoing. And we are enrolling during the pandemic. We have enrolled one patient from the West Coast with the you know, referring rheumatologist in the West Coast helping with the assessment. Uh, but if the patient comes to the, cent the center, of course, is the, the travel, travel expenses are covered. And we hope that we're gonna finish the trial very soon and then we'll be able to analyze uh, the results. And this is the members of our myositis center. And of course, uh, Lisa Ryder is one of the key figures of the center. And uh, we are very grateful to CureJM and the parent volunteers that they work with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Um, anyone have any questions? We're looking forward to hearing the results of the study to have another hopefully, hopefully soon in our repertoire that we can use. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. I, I may have missed this. Can I ask a quick question? You had about half the patients with ILD. It's very high high frequency in your patient population. Really nice study, by the way. Um, did you see any change in the in the lung function? Well, actually, hold on a second. That study is the Sweden study. It's not our study. Oh, I missed that. That's it. Another study that was already published from Sweden. Uh, we have one patient with ILD, but of course we I can't see. Not talk I'm about sorry. results now. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But the question stands in that study from Sweden, did they see improvement in the lung disease? They don't report it on that. Okay. I, I'm not aware if. Uh, Interesting. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. There is a study of the BABSEP that Rohit Agarwal is leading uh, in patients with lung disease uh, in adult myositis. Well, that'd be nice to see about that. the results, yeah. Lisa? Lisa, do you know anything about the results? Oh, no, that study's enrolling now. Okay. We'll move on to um, our next speaker. This is Dr. Quinn Dean. Um, he is um, the Vice President and Head of Medical Affairs at Corbis Pharmaceuticals. He trained at Brown University, um, received his medical degree, and then did residency training at Albert Einstein. He's going to talk to us today about the biology of ECS and CP2 antagonism, agonism, sorry, as a potential target for dermatomyositis and other autoimmune diseases. I'll um, try to keep this interesting and, and brief as much as possible. Um, I want to start by saying that um, I work for a company called Corvus Pharmaceutical and we're based in Norwood, Massachusetts, which is right outside of Boston. And uh, you know, the work and the approach I'm presenting today is obviously not myself alone. It's really reflective of all the experts in the space. Uh, many of the rheumatologists I've worked with internally at the company and externally, and many of our investigators and patients and their ca caregivers. So as you heard earlier this morning, all oh, these are my disclosures. As you heard earlier this morning from Dr. Deverson, um, you know, another uh, potential um, approach, which is endocannabinoid system. I think I'm having very unstable internet, I'm sorry. Um, to consider another approach, which is ECS and the endocannabinoid system, and how that could have a potential um, you know, impact or effect from an anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrotic standpoint, and really focusing on two receptors. And then finally, really to give you a sense of how to differentiate between what we hear a lot about right now in the mainstream on phyto plant-based cannabinoid versus a rationally designed uh, molecules in, in the lab um, for pharmaceutical development and potential treatments. Um, so when you look at the endocannabinoid system, what's really interesting is that not only is it ubiquitous throughout um, the body across all different cell types, organs and whatnot, it's actually quite conserved um, in the animal kingdom, uh, both from vertebrate and invertebrate. And the reason uh, 
uh, folks believe that to be this, uh, the case is that from an evolutionary standpoint, the endocannabinoid system was quite um, uh, important in terms of regulating at a key regulator across um, such things as the uh, fight and flight response in terms of the very innate uh, process of uh, responding to um, threats, external threats from infections and whatnot. And even also in terms of uh, the, the drive, the evolutionary drive to, to, uh, to obtain substance and also how to process substance and nutrition. So I think that's the reason why it's quite ubiquitous. And um, it's a system of G-couple uh, proteins with its receptors, ligands, and all the enzymes that are involved in that. And like, one of the things that is quite ubiquitous uh, because it's helping restoring uh, homeostasis in terms of cellular division and regulating many of these um, physiological processes. So I want to introduce you to two main receptors, CB1 and CB2, which stands for cannabinoid receptor type 1 and cannabinoid receptor type 2. Again, I mentioned it's G-couple of uh, uh, couple receptor proteins, which is the most common type of uh, receptor um, out there. Um, the CB1 um, receptor uh, was first actually um, discovered to be in the brain. And then shortly thereafter, um, the CB2 was discovered um, mostly outside of uh, peripherally indifferentiated hematological and immune cells. Um, they have about 44% uh, amino acid homology. Now, there are other receptors that endogenous and, and endocannabinoids bind to, but for today, we just focus on the two main ones, which is CB1 and CB2. Um, the CB1 and CB2 gene were uh, cloned and ident identified and cloned in the early 90s. Um, and since then, uh, we have a much better understanding of the, um, the molecular basis of CB1 and the, the, the actions of CB1. Uh, from, uh, pet, uh, from radio label PET scans in humans, what you can see here is that um, the CB1 receptor lit up actually throughout the brain, but there are certain parts of the brain where there's high concentration, such as in the uh, basal ganglia, um, the claudate nucleus, and pretty much right next to the limbic system. And I think it speaks so much about um, the CB1 receptor regulating um, behavior, regulating the reward system, and regulating uh, motion, um, um, you know, automotive uh, functions. And interestingly, uh, CB1 is actually the most abundant neuromodulary protein in the brain, and it's located in the presynaptic terminals. Now, there are, there are other variants of CB1 of the subtypes, and interestingly, some of these subtypes are expressed, uh, not in the brain, but peripherally in the uh, hepatocytes and in the beta cells in the pancreas. And um, you know, that, that is overexpressed oftentimes in folks who have high, high BMI. And it shows you that CB1 do also play a role in uh, lipid metabolism and also insulin um, sensitivity. Turning to CB2, uh, as I mentioned earlier, CB2 uh, can be found centrally. However, most of CB2 um, receptors and binding occur peripherally in activated immune cells in both immune, uh, the um, innate and, and the adapted immune cells. Um, and, and I think the reason why it's interesting to uh, look at CB2 agonism is that it potentially could be an approach where it is immunomodulating, but not immunosuppressing. And the reason for that is it only uh, works um, in cells that have over uh, activated um, expression of CB2. Okay. And then there, there has been, um, there has been uh, several uh, important uh, preclinical and early clinical proof concepts that led to Corbis um, you know, having a several program in late stage um, development right now for dermatomyositis, uh, uh, systemic sclerosis, and, and lupus. And the CB2 expression has been found, for example, in CD4 positive uh, skin from patients with DM. As I mentioned earlier, um, the cannabinoid system is conserved um, uh, throughout the animal kingdom endogenously. Um, it's called endocannabinoids, and there are two main uh, metabolites for the endocannabinoids. One is called anatomide, and the other one is 2-AG. And they're both uh, pretty much downstream um, compounds uh, deriving from lipid. Um, uh, you know, obviously, these get metabolized by an enzyme called uh, fatty acid amide hydrolysis, FAH, 
And there has been um, previous studies um, taking advantage of an inhibitor in terms of inhibiting the breakdown of these two compounds, but it hasn't really pan out yet in terms of um, as a targetable approach. Um, turning to the middle column here is the plant-based phytocannabinoids. As many of you know, um, especially in the rheumatology practices, many of your patients come and ask you a lot today about CBD, about THC, about cannabis, about hemp. So um, either there are pharmaceutical being approved uh, for treatments with CBD or CBD and THC, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, what, I, what I really want to really introduce you to is really the concept of endocannabinoid mimetics, which is basically uh, compounds that mimic uh, either uh, molecularly or even through just um, uh, binding studies, taking advantage of the CB2 and CB1 binding. And um, a couple of years ago, there was a drug called Recombinant um, that was approved um, in, in, in Europe uh, as an uh, appetite suppressant because it's a CB1 inverse agonist. It was actually in the process of getting FDA review and approval, but in the midst of that, um, there were um, increased report post-marketing understanding that um, the drug increases um, suicidal thoughts. Uh, so therefore the, uh, the medication was never approved in the United States and was subsequently withdrawn from the e EU marketplace. Lenabacin, which we're talking about here, uh, is a CB2 preferential compound that binds mostly peripherally inactivated immune cells. Uh, it does, does bind a little bit centrally, but not to the extent of something like recombinant or even THC. THC ha actually has the highest CB1 binding centrally, which is the part of um, cannabis that uh, it's been associated for the psychotropic effects. Um, endogenously, I mentioned there are two endocannabinoids, and just to give you a sense, um, they bind more strongly to the three, uh, three to five fold higher to CB1 versus CB2. So that's really the um, where everything is sort of um, measured against in terms of developing endocannabinoids um, in, in the lab. What, what is the evidence in terms of the, um, the, the outcomes of binding to CB1 and CB2? That really comes from the knockout mouse model of CB1 where, uh, you know, under normal physiological basic conditions. Um, and if the, um, the, the, the animals were stressed, um, they exhibit abnormal physiology. So it really goes the reverse. So with knockout mo mouse model, what we find is that there's an increase in depression, anxiety, increase in uh, despair behavior, the opposite of everything that will be with CB1 binding, for example, or folks who uh, use THC or cannabis. And then the reverse side is that there's a decrease in feeding um, decrease in eating, addictive behavior, decrease in body weight, uh, and decrease in total adiposity. Of course, there are uh, numerous other um, effects, such as decrease in inflammation and fibrosis. Interestingly, when you look, when we look at reports of humans with CB1 gene polymorphism, what we see is that they have uh, worsening of uh, you know, uh, particular um, end organ disorders. For example, from a CNS nervous system perspective, um, these patients often have an increase in illicit substance dependency, increase in impulsivity, um, and increase in um, uh, depression. From a metabolism standpoint, they tend to um, have a, a wider circumference, increase in body mass, increasing triglyceride level. So those are some of the examples. Turning to CB2 knockout model, what we see here is an increase in inflammation and fibrosis. Normally, it would be decreasing inflammation and fibrosis. And, and this is something we're trying to take advantage of in terms of CB2 agonist binding. And the reverse of that is really um, there was an increase in spatial uh, working memory, but a decrease in the long term conceptual memory and decrease in fear. Uh, we also looked at CB2 knockout mouse model in systemic sclerosis-like disease. And here what you see is we look at uh, skin biopsies of lung and skin. And so here, um, so let's start with the lung. Um, in, 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 the in the mouse model that uh, has the knockout under normal basal condition, nothing really happens when you stress um, the tissue with hypochlorite, which is known to generate oxidative radical, what you see here is definitely increase in inflammation and fibrosis. And the same can be seen to the right with the skin biopsy on H&E staining. 
Um, taking it further, um, there's a um, mouse model for interstitial lung disease using bleomycin. And over a 21-day period, what you can see here versus control is that bleomycin um, you know, increases the inflammation, the process of um, acute and then chronic inflammation and follow on uh, delay in tissue repair and increase in fibrosis. Uh, when the uh, CB2 agonist lenabacin is added to the mix of uh, bleomycin in a dose-dependent manner, what you see is a decrease in the process of inflammation and fibrosis, and you see the staining, the intensity of the staining is reflected in, in, the, um, in the slides. Uh, we also looked at uh, reports of CB2 gene um, polymorphism here, and in this case, uh, because of the um, uh, in, increased um, inflammation and in fibroxid patients who have underlying viral infections such as uh, hepatitis and HIV, they actually have more severe uh, necroinflammatory liver uh, from chronic hepatitis. Um, and they also have a much higher and much more persistent uh, elevation of the liver enzymes, oftentimes despite treatment. And sometimes they also have more severe a respiratory tract infection. Again, this is additional evidence to demonstrate the importance or the role that um, endocannabinoid and CB2 system play in terms of resolving inflammation. And here is a very busy slide to show you the classic um, process of acute chronic inflammation, uh, starting out with uh, vascular injury um, and leading to fibrosis. So the uh, from all the um, evidence we have today, we believe that the endocannabinoid system can play a role in helping to resolve um, the inflammation and thereby uh, also um, decreasing fibrosis through, um, uh, through decreasing pro-inflammatory cytokines in, in chemokines that were mentioned earlier today, increasing anti-inflammatory mediators, which there are a bunch of those, and increasing pro-resolving lipid mediators and decreasing probiotic mediators. So I just want to give you an example of approved medications right now for phytocannabinoid plant-based. Uh, very early on, um, there, there was a medication called Amerinol and Syndrose. Um, they were basically synthetic uh, THC, the drabinol, and they were approved for nausea and vomiting um, due to chemotherapy uh, for, uh, and also HIV AIDS-induced anorexia. And that was uh, followed by um, another uh, synthetic THC called nabinolone, and that was approved for nausea and vine, also from uh, chemotherapy. More recently, about a year and a half ago, um, there's an approval for medication. It's actually purely CBD, um, Epidiolox. Um, it was approved for a very rare a pediatric uh, epilepsy disorders, uh, Lino-Gestalt syndrome and Dravet, and it's in development for other um, uh, rare disease and other disorders. But this is a CBD base. We actually don't know how it works in terms of um, being able to decrease um, um, the episodes of seizures. Um, we really don't really know how it really, uh, the mechanism of that. Of that. We're not sure if it's through um, the CB1 or CB2 or through something else. And finally, more recently, there's an approval for a, a spray, an extract spray with combined THC and CBD. And that's for MS-related plasticity and neuropathic pain and also for cancer pain. Um, turning to the lead compound, so at Corbis, we have a lead compound called anabacin. We also have a library of a few hundred of an endocannabinoids that we're looking at um, that um, either work at the CB1 or even the CB2 receptor, really taking advantage of depending what indication we're looking at. In this uh, ribbon model, uh, you know, you see the anabacin is the molecule in purple binding to the active site of the CB1 receptors. Uh, turning to clinical trials, um, in light of um, we don't have much time, um, I encourage you to look at ACR last year in 2019. We presented um, a, you know, a post, actually oral presentation um, of our phase two um, double blind placebo 16 week, a small small study, uh, 22 patients in adult DM patients, um, over 90% of the patients, I think about 18 of them now are, are in their um, second third year of anabacin um, uh, treatment in open label um, fashion. Uh, what we study in this um, um, proof concept phase two is actually in patients with um, clinically 
amylotropin for the most part uh, with cutaneous uh, manifestation. Um, so SIDASI was our um, endpoint there. And we show um, a clinical activity uh, decrease in SIDASI score. And uh, it appears to also be uh, maintained in an open label uh, fashion. Now, a four point reduction we saw very early on in the first 12 months. And I think that's significant because four point reduction has been shown in associated with improvement in skin related quality of life, itch, and pain. Um, we, we plan to uh, submit um, a paper to the manuscript soon. So that, that, that is in the works. Turning to the phase three program, it's called the Determined Study. Um, this is a 52 week study. It, it, it is the largest uh, adult DM study to date, 150 patients, uh, two to one to two uh, randomization uh, with uh, two, two, two doses, uh, 20 milligram twice a day, five milligram placebo. Uh, the primary endpoint here uh, with discussion with regulatory agency um, is the total improvement score as the primary, although we have uh, a number of other secondary endpoints that should be supportive um, in terms of uh, looking at the efficacy of lenabacin in this patient population. Uh, we, we completed enrollment in early August. Um, for this ACR this year, uh, we were presenting um, the preliminary um, blinded overall baseline characteristics um, of the patient, of the a whole 177 patients who were enrolled. Um, so I was encouraged you to have a chance, take a look at that at ACR in terms of the patient population we'll be studying. And we hope to have the results in um, third quarter of next year. And with that, I would just like to close that the endocannabinoid system, um, you know, is, is a very uh, potential rational therapeutic tar target based on its role as a key regulator of immune homeostasis in the body. Um, you know, phytocannabinoids, THC and or CBD have been approved by regulatory agency for treatment of um, severe diseases or symptoms related to um, diseases and adverse events of CB1 agonism are, um, are an issue. So in, I think from a development standpoint, uh, we're trying to avoid the CB1 um, on the brain, but really act on the CB2 or, or do something called CB1 inverse agonist antagonist. Um, we, we did report, unfortunately, we did report negative top line results from the large, uh, from the large phase three resolve one SSC. And more recently, um, the CF program, we also have a program in cystic fibrosis. Uh, we're analyzing the data as of today, and we will be presenting more in terms of where we believe um, there could be potential clinical activity in subset of um, the patient population of SSC and CF. Uh, we are still very excited about our ongoing work in DM and also in uh, our lupus study. Our lupus study briefly is uh, in phase two. It's a study that is um, funded and being run by the NIH. And with that, I wanna thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. And we really look forward to hearing the outcomes of the adult study. Uh, it would be great to think about something like this for children. Hopefully you are starting to think about that as well. Um, can I ask a question? You talked about drabinol being used for some of the side effects of HIV. Do you know if it affects lipodystrophy, a problem that we have in myositis sometimes? No, I, I have not come across data, but I can follow up for you. Okay, thank you. Um, so there was a question about why were patients with myositis excluded from your study? In the phase two, I guess that's the question. But if right, I mean, it's why just the cutaneous patients and excluded active muscle disease? Yeah, um, the rationale for that is um, given that we have much more mature data with systemic sclerosis, and we felt that um, we have an impact on the skin aspect of the disease first, and it's really unknown what impact we might potentially could have on the myositis part. So I think for a proof of concept phase two, it was very reasonable to not only you know, approach it from a 22 patient, but really be focused on the predominantly um, amyopathic patients. Although some patients did have a muscle um, uh, aspects to their disease, but we kept it to mostly amyopathic. And then we did see clinical activity, and therefore, I think in this larger study, we um, we open it up to um, um, to the bar broader population. And in fact, 85% um, of the patient in the phase three 
or classic DM, or classic DM adult. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. If there's no more questions, then um, we'll move on to our final speaker. Um, and Dr. Kave Ardalan, he's an assistant professor of pediatrics at Duke University, um, is going to do our wrap up. Um, Kave um, trained at the University of Pittsburgh, um, was at Northwestern uh, for a few years and then joined us at Duke uh, a couple of years ago. He, um, in his career, has really focused his care for juvenile myositis patients, both treatment and also looking at emotional and, um, and you know, psychological effects of disease and medications on, on patients. So I'll let Kavi take. Thanks so much, Anne, for the introduction. And uh, I'm just going to try to share my screen. I've got a couple of slides that we can run through very quickly. Um, can everybody see the title slide? Yes. Okay, great. So just briefly, this is uh, New Drugs in JM, Patient Voice at the Cutting Edge. And um, <clears throat> I have no financial conflicts to disclose. This is some current funding. So I just wanted to take a moment um, as we wrap up to reorient um, our attention for a moment to the folks that we're serving, the patients and their families, and thinking about both the tremendous need for novel therapeutics, um, but also ways that as trials continue to be designed and uh, um, uh, conduct, excuse me, conducted um, that we can integrate patient voice um, and what aspects of uh, children's experiences and families' experiences we would integrate. So you know, here, just summarizing a lot of what's already been discussed that uh, for many reasons, we need uh, novel therapeutics. Um, and this is just from a ACR abstract that we had presented a couple years ago from uh, data from Dr. Pachman's uh, cohort of patients that suggests that physical um, disability persists for years actually in a pretty substantial subset of our patients. And so we clearly can and need to do better. Um, and we also, in addition to developing novel therapeutics, uh, want to try and think of ways to get the right therapeutic agent to the right patient. Um, so there's been a lot of progress on this front, thinking about the role of myositis antibodies and helping to select appropriate treatments. Um, you know, reanalyses of uh, rituximab and myositis study data that helped with identifying subsets of patients that might be more likely to uh, respond favorably. And that actually includes children with myositis. Um, predicting risk of toxicity. There's work that folks like Mara Becker and others have done, I um, mean, not necessarily myositis specific, but just generally thinking about um, risk of methotrexate toxicity, assessing risk of flare. I mean, there are some interesting biomarker studies coming out of uh, the Netherlands on this topic. And then long-term outcomes, you know, what are the predictors of remission on and off medications? Is there a sequence of treatment that might increase the chance of medication-free remission in the future? And also eventually uh, starting to think even more broadly about what the relevant outcomes are, particularly cardiovascular disease, which there seems to be early indications that DM and JDM uh, are probably similar to SLE in terms of their cardiovascular disease risk. So um, patient reported outcome measures are an important quantitative tool for integrating patient and family voice into trials. And we have a number of legacy measures um, that have been used in studies um, for JDM and adult DM patients. But uh, there are some important limitations of the current measures. These include uh, floor and ceiling effects, meaning patients who end up scoring quote unquote normal, even though they may not actually in real life be experiencing normalcy on that particular domain. Uh, limitations in terms of interpretability. We don't always have great um, understanding of what the meaning of score changes on some of these measures uh, translates to in terms of the, the patient's actual experience. Um, some assessments can be lengthy and some uh, tools are limited by cost and licensing requirements that are restrictive. Um, one possible avenue forward would be the use of PROMISE measures. These are patient reported outcome measurement information system uh, measures. And I won't go into tons of detail, but there are a couple of ACR abstracts we've presented over the last few years in ju juvenile myositis with manuscripts actually forthcoming. Um, and Promise offers a few interesting opportunities. So first would be uh, computerized adaptive testing. So this is where actually an initial question is administered, say about mobility. And based on that first uh, response, an algorithmic selection of the next item for that particular patient is, uh, is done and that next question is administered. 
um, with that patient in mind. So the idea here is that if you're giving the questions that matter most to the patient in relation to their level of disease severity, you might actually improve measurement precision and decrease the tendency towards those floor and ceiling effects. And uh, actually one of these abstracts um, suggests, uh, suggests that this is actually the case when we use computerized adaptive testing compared to fixed forms that give the same questions to all. Um, scores uh, generated from promise measures are normalized to the general population. So that makes them easier to interpret um, and also facilitates pooling and comparison of the data across disease populations. And unique among uh, the measures that I've presented today, you can actually cross-link adult and pediatric measures um, when using promise. So this facilitates life course studies and potentially for um, studies in a rare disease population where we often will enroll adult and pediatric patients. This is a key um, strength actually. Um, so in general, I would just uh, say that I think there's a strong urge um, towards integrating uh, patient report outcome measures into clinical trials and registries as key endpoints. Uh, it's important to collect both patient and parent data uh, because there are actually systematic differences in the scores depending on who is the respondent. On average in JM and other pediatric populations, parents actually seem to rate their children as doing worse than the children themselves um, will rate their health related quality of life. Um, so that's an important distinction when, when going for analysis. And then um, it's also important to actually include patients, families and other stakeholders when deciding which measures to use and which domains of health related quality of life to assess in trials. And uh, there's some work on the patient engagement front um, to, to uh, better do that. Um, here at Duke, we have the Center for Population Health Sciences and that's actually one of their core strengths. Um, and this is really interesting. People are proposing use of mixed methods. So qualitative and quantitative methods to think more um, in a patient centered way about the interpretability of these patient reported outcome measures and, and improve trial designs. So one example of this is shifting from clinically important differences, uh, which are calculated for patient report outcome measures, so-called minimal important difference that we, we've all, all seen, um, and instead thinking about clinically meaningful changes. So actually um, qualitatively interviewing patients and parents and, and getting information about if your score changes by this amount, what does that actually mean in your life? And is that a change that actually matters or is this just a statistical change um, that may not actually be very important to, to the folks that we're uh, serving. The other uh, thing to think about is qualitative assessment of facilitators and barriers to trial participation. I believe uh, that the LIMIT JIA study uh, in juvenile arthritis through CARA actually has like a sub-study that uses ethnography to think about um, why it is that some families do or don't uh, participate in that trial and um, you know how we can better in, uh, you know, make, make studies more accessible to families so that they'll feel comfortable participating. So we should be thinking outside the box about how um, the voice of the patient and the family actually can enhance the science that we're uh, conducting. And just final topic that I wanted to address today uh, is mental health in JM. And this is a figure from a publication by Polly Livermore and, and uh, co-authors in the UK about the JDM roller coaster. Uh, this is a very dynamic condition to live with, to say the least. And even for folks who are in remission, that does not necessarily mean that everything is perfectly okay. Um, from an abstract that um, uh, Polly Livermore and Lucy Wetterburn presented at last year's ACR, um, about 40% of patients that they assessed had emotional distress sufficient to warrant psychological referral. That's really important actually. There's to my knowledge, not been a study of depression and anxiety per se in um, JM. There's a lot of literature on quality of life, but not necessarily those particular constructs. And if this data holds up um, and we see it uh, survive peer review and all that, uh, then this is actually a very concerning finding. Interestingly, they found that illness uncertainty is seemed to be a contributor to worse quality of life. That rep excuse me, that replicates findings in other chronic, particularly autoimmune diseases where there's a lot of unpredictability on that roller coaster uh, that folks are living on. And also importantly, that there weren't really differences by age, gender, and disease duration, which suggests that you know, emotional distress can occur to anyone at any time um, who is living with JM. And we need to think about this across the, the disease course. Um, 
we actually just uh, published a qualitative study that looked for the first time at parent per uh, perspectives on emotional distress in JAM. And I want to thank Care JAM Foundation for the funding they provided, as well as for providing the uh, opportunity to conduct the study at the 2018 Family Conference. Um, and just briefly, what we found, and you can read the manuscript now at Arthritis Care and Research, um, that basically emotional distress is prevalent, persistent, and quite intense um, for kids living uh, with JM. And importantly, this is a, a figure where if you look at the concentric ovals kind of towards the bottom, what we found is that the emotional health of the child is nested within the emotional health of the parent and the larger family. So this is a disease that, like many others, ripples through the whole family unit. Um, there did seem to be some tendency towards uh, young adulthood towards developing a sense of resiliency and might say um, kind of even growth or, or learning from the experience, but that doesn't mean that this was somehow an edifying thing to go, go through. It just means that people are able to contextualize what they've gone through and make sense of it. Even still, parents were very clear to us that their young adults with um, juvenile onset dermatomyositis, like still, still they felt they were quite um, at times fragile and at risk of, of backsliding into quite a bit of distress, especially if they were to flare. And so we have a lot of opportunities to, to intervene um, to improve mental health in JM. So my conclusions for, the, for this would just be to say that we need novel therapeutics given all the challenges that uh, kids with JM and their families are facing. We can integrate their voices into studies using um, novel patient reported outcome measures like promise measures. And given this rising um, concern in our literature um, that emotional distress is actually a, a serious issue for our patients and their families, it would be um, worth considering integrating measures of emotional distress into trials to see if good treatments of the disease start to alleviate some contributors to stress. And um, I think we can advance the care and well being of our patients through creative use of mixed quantitative and qualitative approaches and stakeholder engagement. So, Thank you so much. And uh, I think if, um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer, but given that we're a little over time, I'll just uh, also hand it off to Andrew Heaton, who will probably be wrapping up for us now. Thank you, Carve. Um, as ever, a wonderful presentation and really reminding us about everything that we need to do for total patient care. Um, and we're obviously uh, very interested in all those measures, not just looking at new drugs. Um, firstly, um, just in closing, could I again thank all the presenters um, for taking um, part and giving away their Saturday. Again, could I do a special um, shout out to um, our colleagues at the Duke Centre of Excellence. So Anne Carvey and Jeff, thank you so much for all your help and assistance. Uh, Jeff, uh, for going above and beyond the call of duty for getting the CMEs for this. Um, I can't thank you enough um, for that. Um, as I indicated at the very start, the foundation really places a lot of emphasis on collaboration and some of the real take home messages. We wanna to get to some of the clinicians that we perhaps haven't had um, as strong a relationship or any relationship with you previously. The things that we'd really like to emphasize are, are things like um, two of the critical trials that were discussed today that are in our JDM patient population, the value of those trials will only be realised once their trials are completed and they're read out. So I, th I think a special note, um, um, Adam's trial um, on his calcinosis sodium thiosulfate, I think he's still chasing five more patients. Um, and uh, Rodolfo is, as he said, he is achingly close. Um, they need one more patient enrolled to finish um, his study and they're even um, pivoting in the times of COVID-19 to look at enrolling patients um, that are geographically remote from the prime center. So they've done a wonderful job at pivoting and having the capacity to enroll patients without having them move um, across lots of state borders. Um, so I'd encourage um, people to get in contact directly with those uh, clinicians. If you have any patients, you are potentially going to refer to them. If not, um, please reach out to me. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to point out is for those clinicians, <clears throat> those people running clinics that we haven't um, spoken to directly before, uh, we provide free 
um, edu educational and support information packages um, for families that may attend your clinic. Um, we present a nice little package of um, uh, 15 um, family support little care packages. Um, you can uh, receive those if you're in the lower 48. Uh, we're happy to mail you a hard copy. Um, if you're obviously not in the lower 48, if you email us, we will um, uh, get you a, um, a digital copy. So if you um, email us at info at curejm.org, we will get those to you. Um, and we'll also be following up uh, with some emails um, about the conference and just reaching out to those clinicians and those clinics that we haven't had any previous contact with. So again, thank you for all for your attendance. Thank you to the presenters. Um, thank you to Claire and Shannon for doing so much work in the background and helping me get the conference out to this state. So I will now let you all get your Saturdays back um, online.